there. Let's make sure to drag that. So let's drag the meat patty from uncooked into cooked. Okay. Let's also drag the counter top point. And finally, since we already made the script over here on the selected, we can also drag the selected. Okay. So our stove prefab should be working. Okay. Let's go outside, make sure to save the prefab. Okay. Now let's continue with the rest of the script. So let's make our override. So override the interact action. And when we interact with it, let's validate dropping the object just like we did on the cutting counter. So let's go over here into our cutting counter script and let's just copy pretty much the exact same thing. So let's copy all of this interact code. Let's go over here in the stove counter and just paste it. Now we also need to copy in our recipe. So over here on the cutting counter, let's copy paste those functions. So these functions go into the stove counter and over here, let's paste them. They're going to work pretty much the same thing. So we get an input, except instead of being a cutting recipe SO, we're going to have a frying recipe SO. So let's replace all the cutting recipe references with frying recipe reference. Then for the array, this one is the frying recipe SO array. And obviously let's rename these. So control RR to rename all of them into frying recipe SO. Let's also rename the function instead of get cutting recipe SO, it's the frying recipe SO. Okay, so there's no more mentions of cutting over here. So let's use this function up here and up here. And just make sure to rename these, the frying recipe SO. And down here, all same thing. So the frying recipe SO. Okay, so down here we have no more mentions of any cutting. Let's just go up here and solve all these problems. So first we check if there's no kitchen object here and if the player is carrying something, then we see if what the player is carrying matches any kind of frying recipe. If so, then the player is carrying something that can be fried. Then we set the parent and for now, let's not worry about the progress. So let's just get rid of all of this, just like this. Okay, so with this, we should be able to drop, but only an uncooked meat. So back in the editor, let's just set up our scene. So let's drag a stove counter onto our scene. Let's put over there on X of six, Y of zero and 3.5. All right, so let's test. Okay, so now if I pick up some cheese, I go up there and I drop it and nope, doesn't work. Okay, great. But if I pick up some uncooked meat and I go and I drop it and yep, that does work. Okay, great. So it works and I can only drop the actual objects that match the recipe. Now, unlike the cutting counter, this one will not be based on a player alt interaction. And actually over here, let's fix this minor issue. Basically, we added this debug.log error to the base interact because pretty much every single counter is going to implement this interact function, but not all counters are going to have the interact alternate action. So on this one, let's just do nothing. Let's not spawn an error. Okay, just a quick fix. So like I said, the stove counter, this one is going to be based on a simple timer. And for making some time-based logic, basically we have two approaches. One approach is to use a simple flow timer, or you can also use a coroutine. Now, a lot of tutorials will teach you how to use a coroutine, and that's not necessarily a bad practice. It does work. It does achieve the desired result. So to do that, you would just make a function like fry timer. So you'd make a private, you have to return I in numerator, then call it something like handle fry timer. Then inside you can do a yield return and return a new wait for seconds. And to start this coroutine, you would do maybe on start, you would call start coroutine and start the handle fry timer. So this is one approach. This is definitely perfectly valid timer code. However, personally, I am not a fan of coroutines. It's not because of performance or anything. It's simply because I don't like the pattern that they force you to use. I don't like being forced to make a function that returns I enumerator. I don't like using yield return. I don't like having to use the start coroutine function. I don't like being forced to use this on a mono behavior object. Those are all requirements for making a coroutine work. And personally, I find those are way too many requirements that create a very strange pattern that I really don't like. So that's really the only reason. I don't like coroutines because I find this pattern to be quite a lot convoluted. So instead of coroutines, what I like to use are simple basic flow timers. So just make a simple private void update. Then we just need to keep track of a certain timer. So for example, a simple private float frying timer. Then on the update, let's first check that we have an object. So it has a kitchen object. If we have a kitchen object, then let's increase the timer by time dot of time. By the way, here when working with a timer, you can increase or decrease. It's pretty arbitrary, both ways work. 
The obvious difference is only if you test if it's above the max or if it's under zero. In here for frying, it does make sense to start at zero and then the, the frying timer max. So you do that and if the frying timer, if it is bigger than the maximum, so let's get the frying recipe SO, frying recipe SO, let's get the frying recipe SO with input, so let's get this kitchen object and get the kitchen object SO. Okay, so we go into the frying recipe SO and we get the frying timer max. Okay, so if it's above the max, then this one has been fried. So here I'll let you see what we did on the cutting counter. So let's get this kitchen object and tell it to destroy itself. And then let's go into the kitchen object class in order to spawn another kitchen object. Let's go into the frying recipe and spawn the output. And we're going to spawn it inside of this counter. Alright, so that's it. This should already be working. We don't have a visual yet, so let's add a debug log. So up here, just a debug.log on the frying timer. And up here, let's also just reset the timer. So frying timer, let's put it on 0F. And let's also do a debug.log and say fried. However, like this, you might already be guessing that we're going to have a bunch of bugs, but still, let's just test it just like this. Okay, so over here, I can move around. I can pick up some uncooked meat. I can drop it there. And after a little bit, there you go, there's the timers. And yep, there you go, it did work. You can see the timer increase until three. Then it was fried, then it was reset, and then we've got a null reference exception. Basically, this is the exact same problem that we had on the cutting counter, where first we put an object like tomato, and that is indeed an input for a recipe. So we cut tomato into slices, but then the slices are not an input for any recipe. So over here, we put some uncooked meat, so that's great. We fry it, which means we destroy the uncooked meat and we spawn the cooked meat. But then the next time, the cooked meat is not an input for anything, so obviously this one is going to return null. One thing we can do to sort of solve this problem, which is also going to be beneficial in terms of performance, is simply caching this field. So let's go up here, define a frying recipe SO, frying recipe SO, instead of constantly getting it on every single update, which might be a bit costly in terms of performance. Instead of this, let's just get it over here when the player drops something. So the player drops something and we assign the frying recipe SO, so we assign it, cache the value, and then do this. Okay, that should have fixed the null reference problem, but we still have a bunch more problems, but still, let's test it out. Okay, so here, let's pick up some meat, put it there, and let's look at the timer, and yep, there you go, everything is cooking, great, and yep, there you go, it finished, it cooked, and the timer was reset, and now it's finishing, it's cooking, and so on. So this is obviously another pretty serious problem, basically it's constantly frying the meat and spawning more and more objects. Instead of constantly spawning from the same recipe, what we want is for the stove to first fry the object, but then if the object is fried, then we want to burn it. So really, that means that we want the stove to have multiple states, meaning that we're going to need to make a simple state machine. So let's do just that. Now, if you're a beginner, the concept of a state machine might seem daunting at first, but it's actually extremely simple, at least to make a very basic one. All we need is really just a bunch of states. So to define those states, let's go up here and make a simple enum. So let's make a private enum, call it state. And now let's put all the states for our state machine. Now for the stove, let's say we have idle when there's nothing on top. Then let's say we have a frying state for when the ingredient is actually being fried. Then we have fried for when the ingredient has already been cooked, but it's still getting some heat. And finally, if we leave it too long in that state, then everything ends up burned. Okay, so these are all of our states for our state machine. And now to make the actual state machine, it's actually quite simple. First of all, we just need to store the current state. So up here, make a private of type state and store the current state. And then on update, let's just do a switch on the current state. And now here, basically, we're going to do different logic depending on the state that we're at. So let's say if we're idle, we do something. Then if we are frying, we're going to do something else. Then if we are on the fried, also something else. And finally, if we are on burn, do something else. So here are all of our states. And the logic that we did down here, this is the frying logic. So let's actually just copy all of this and let's paste it inside the frying logic. And for the state machine, we're only going to run any of these states if there's a kitchen object inside of it. So let's actually put that switch in there just like this. Okay, so that's it. So when idle, we're not doing anything. And when frying, we're going to run our frying timer. We're going to fry the object. Let's also get rid of the log. We no longer need this. Then we destroy the current object and we spawn a brand new object. Now what we need is to handle over here the state field. We need to modify this when changing states. So first of all, let's end the start. So let's make a private void start. And on start, let's begin with the state on state.idle. Okay, great. 
Then down here, when we interact, when the player drops something, when the player drops something that can be fried, over here, let's set the state and put it on state.frying. And over here, we should also probably reset the timer. So let's set the frying timer back into 0F. Okay, we set the timer and we reset the state. Finally, up here, let's not reset the timer since we're resetting the timer down there, since it makes more sense down there. So we do the frying, the frying timer, we end up frying, and then obviously we need to modify the state. So modify state and put it on state.fry. Okay, so that's the basics of our state machine. With this, everything should be working just the same as previously, except we're only going to fry once. So let's actually just put a log here, debug on log, object fried. And let's put one down here outside of the state machine. Just do a debug.log on the state. Okay, like this, let's test. Okay, so here we are. Let's pick up some meat and drop it on there. And there you go, it goes from idle directly into frying. And then it's fried. And yep, there you go, now it stays on fried. So it no longer goes on frying and it's no longer spawning any more objects. It went from frying into fried and yep, everything worked. All right, awesome. So we have the frying state working perfectly. Now let's handle the burning. In terms of logic, it's really going to be the exact same thing. We're going to have a frying timer. So let's copy this code and paste it down here. Now, technically we could reuse the exact same float timer, but that would be a bit confusing. So let's keep our code as clear as possible and really just make a different timer with a more descriptive name. So up here, a private float, call it the burning timer. Then let's initialize this timer. So when we go into the fried state, let's set the timer, the burning timer into zero. Then down here, let's use this burning timer. Okay, great. When timer is elapsed and the object is spawned, let's go into the burn state. And obviously we need another recipe. So let's make another scriptable object. Back in the editor, let's find the frying recipe SO. Let's duplicate this, call it the burning recipe SO. Then over here, let's modify the name. Instead of frying timer max, let's call it burning timer max. Okay, great. So now over here on the stove, let's use pretty much the exact same thing. And let's make over here private of burning recipe SO, the burning recipe SO. Then down here, we just need a function to get the burning recipe SO. So let's copy this and paste it over here. This one's going to return a burning recipe SO. So let's replace this and this. Rename this into burning recipe SO. We're going to need an array. And over here, let's just change the name. Set of frying recipe SO, the burning recipe SO. And finally, let's just find a new array. So let's go all the way up here, make another array, an array of burning recipe SO. And this is the burning recipe SO array. And finally, if we go down here, let's use this array. Okay, that's it. So now let's use this function to set our burning recipe SO. So when we set it to fried, let's set the burning recipe SO and let's get it with the input. And the input is gonna be the object that is on here. So the kitchen object dot get the kitchen object SO. Okay, so we're initializing our fried state and setting up the burning recipe SO. And over here we use that one dot max and we go into that one and use the output. So over there, object fried and over here, object burned. All right, so that's pretty much it. We modified everything to say burning timer. Over here we are correctly initializing. So we go through the burning timer through the burning recipe SO, which we are grabbing up here. Then we spawn the output on the burning recipe SO and we go into state dot burned. Okay, so all that's left is just filling in this array. So back in the editor over here, let's make the object. So let's make a brand new folder for the burning recipe SO. And now inside, let's create a new burning recipe SO. Call this one the meat patty cooked into meat patty burned. And over here, let's set the input. So the meat patty cooked onto the meat patty burned. And for timer, let's make it take a bit longer to burn. So let's say five seconds. Okay, that's great. Let's just drag the reference. So let's go into the stove counter and let's make sure to open up and go inside the prefab. And over here on the prefab, just drag the burning recipe. Okay, that's great. Let's go outside, save the prefab and let's test. All right, so here we are. Let's pick up some meat, drop it on there and look over there. It's frying and after a bit, yep, it's fried. There you go, it spawned that one. And now if we wait for five seconds, it should go from frying into burn. And yep, there you go, that one is charred. Everything is burned, everything is great. All right, awesome. So everything worked as intended. With this, all of our logic is working. Now let's handle picking up objects from the stove. Now technically it's already working, so I can approach the stove and pick it up the object. And there you go, drop it in there. So that does work. However, if we look over here in the log, the state machine is now in the wrong state. So over here, let's do a quick fix. 
Let's go down into the interact action. Okay, so here it is. So if there's no kitchen object, then the player places it. Okay, that's good. But if there is a kitchen object, so if there's something on the stove counter, when the player picks it up, let's also manually set the state and put the state back into idle, just like this. Okay, that's it, so let's test. Okay, so over here, let's pick up some meat, put it in there, it's cooking, and let's wait until it gets finished. Yep, there you go, it's done, pick it up, and there you go, out. Now, if I want, I can put another one, and yep, there you go, the logic is reset, and everything is back to normal. Okay, great, so all of the logic is working perfectly. Now, let's just get rid of our logs, so we don't need this, so let's get rid of that debug log, this one, and this one. Okay, great, everything is nice and clean. And now let's add some nice fun visuals. So if we go inside the stove counter and over here is the visual and I include these two prefabs inside the visual. So one of them, this one, the stove on visual, this one is just a glowing red square. Now again, there's a weird bug on this specific Unity version. So post-processing isn't showing over here on scene view, but if I leave it enabled and I go back outside and now if we look in the game view, yep, there you go. There's a nice glowing red square. If you don't see it glowing, make sure you add the bloom post-processing effect. So if you missed something, you can go back into the post-processing lecture and make sure everything is set up correctly. So there's a nice glowing red square and there's also a bunch of particles. So you can enable this one, press on restart, and there you go, just some nice particles just jumping up. This was made with the Unity particle system. So for example, on the hierarchy, you can right click, go up here into effects and you can create a particle system. So that's what this is. It has a particle system over here. You can see all of the various settings. For these particles, they just jump up and fall down. So for jumping up, that is the emission. You can actually see a visual over there of the cone. That is the spawning cone, which you can find over here on the shape. So in the shape, it has the shape of a cone. Then you can see the radius, the radius thickness, and so on. So that is from where the objects are being spawned. Then up here, you can see the lifetime of each object. So each particle is going to last for 0.7 seconds. You can also see the speed, so that's the speed at which they come from there. The start size, that's how big they are on start. And note how the particles are spawning, jumping up and falling down. So that falling down is over here, the gravity modifier. If you put it at zero, then they just keep going up. And if you put it at two, yep, they go up and they fall down. Next down here on the emission, this is how many are being spawned. So if I put this on 200, there you go, tons and tons of particles. Next is over here the size over lifetime, so this one has just a basic curve. So they start off on full size and over the x-axis, this one is the lifetime. So as the particle goes from the beginning until the end of their life, they basically go down on size, so that is why they become quite a bit smaller. Also, by the way, this one down here, this one is called an animation curve. This is another really useful Unity feature. I have a dedicated video on animation curves. And finally, down here, just have the renderer. So it's just using some basic particles. So we can inspect the material, it's including the assets. And there you go, it's just using the default particle material, just with the alpha on half, and that's pretty much it. So as you can see, just a very basic, very simple particle system. Now, all we really want to do is just, for both of these, we want to enable or disable them, depending on if the stove is on or not. So let's make a script to handle the visuals. So let's go down and create a brand new C-sharp script. Let's call it the stove counter visual. Then let's go into the stove counter visual and let's attach the script. So here it is, attach it and open. All right, so now here we just need references to those two objects. So as usual, let's make a basic serialized field. Let's make it of type game object for the stove on game object. And the other one is the particles game object. Okay, let's save. And back here in the editor, let's drag the references. So the stove on visual and the sizzling particles. Okay, great. So now all we really need to know is know when to turn these on or off. And for that is really going to be based on the state over here on the stove counter. So if it is on the state frying or fried, then we want to show them. If it is on idle or burned, we want to hide them. But as usual, we don't want to mix the logic and the visuals directly. So let's do that through a really nice event. Let's make a public event. Let's use a standard event handler. Let's call it on state changed. And let's also include the state on the event args. So let's make a public class, call it on state changed event args, and let's expand event args. And then in here, let's just put a public state for our state. However, here we also have a really nice error. So this one is telling you there's inconsistent accessibility. Basically that's because we made this one public so any class, like for example, our visual class can indeed see this class. However, from outside that class cannot see the private state. So that is why we have inconsistent accessibility. 
we cannot have something public which inside has something of a specific type which is private. So in order to make this work, we need to modify this state and make it public so that the other classes can see it. Okay, so that's great. Now let's just fire this event whenever the state changes. So over here, when you go into the frying state, let's go and invoke, and as usual, just this. And I actually forgot to add that, so let's go up here. Let's use the one with generics, so the on state change event args. Okay, great. So then down here, when invoke the event, let's create of this type. And inside passing the state equals this state. Okay, so this is all we need. So then down here, go into the burn state, let's fire the event. And down here, frying, fire the event, and on idle, fry the event. All right, that's it. So we have all of our state logic. And now over here on the stove counter visual, obviously we need a reference to the counter, so let's add that. So a serialized field, private, make it of type stove counter for the stove counter. And then we can do, and as usual, for accessing external references, let's do it on start. Go into the stove counter, and let's listen to the on state changed event. And over here, it's going to be very simple. We just want to show if it's on the state frying or fried, and if not, we don't want to show. So let's define a bool called show visual. And this one is going to true if the e.state equals the state.frying or e.state equals the state.fried. So if it's either of these, then this is going to be true. If not, it's going to be false. So then let's just go into the stove on game object and call set active and pass in this. And same thing for the other, for the particles game object. Okay, that's it, super simple. Let's just drag this reference. So over here inside the prefab, just drag the reference. Let's leave the prefab, save the changes, and let's hit on play. And all right, so it starts off disabled. Okay, so there's no visual. Now if I pick up and I drop it, and there you go, a nice visual. So the glowing red hot and the particles, and now it's frying. And if I leave it until it burns, when it burns, then it's going to turn it off. And if there you go, it turns off. All right, awesome. So now if I pick it up, wait until it gets cooked. So it's cooked, pick it up, and there you go, it turns it off. All right, awesome. We've got a really nice visual. All that's left is to have a proper visual progress bar. And with this, we actually have another interesting clean code question. Right now, the progress bar that we made over here on the cutting counter, that one is great, so we would like to reuse that. However, if you look over here on the progress bar UI, we can see that this is only working with the specific type cutting counter. So by default, this will not work with a stove counter. So as usual, we have multiple approaches to solving this problem. One option would be to simply completely duplicate the script. Then we would make a completely different progress bar UI class that would work only with the stove counter. So that's one approach that would work. And that approach might be good if you want the progress bar to behave very, very differently. But over here, I want both of them to behave exactly the same. So instead of having some code duplication, we can write some good clean code, but doing exactly what we did with regards to the kitchen object parent. Meaning we can use a nice interface we can then implement on anything that has some kind of progress. So let's do exactly that. First of all, let's actually go inside the cutting counter. So let's go inside the prefab. And over here, we've got the progress bar. And this one is just a regular game object. But since we're going to reuse this, let's make this a proper prefab. So let's find over here all of our prefabs and just drag the progress bar UI inside the prefabs folder. Okay, great. So this is now a proper prefab. Now let's define our interface. So let's create a brand new C -sharp script. As usual, interface start with I. So let's call it I. And for this one, we wanted to represent anything that has progress. So let's just call it literally has progress. Personally, I like to use the word has to indicate that a certain object has certain behavior. So in this case, objects that implement this interface will have some kind of progress behavior. So now over here for the interface, let's first make it so this one does not extend mono behavior. Instead of a class, this one is an interface. Okay, great. So now for the functions that we're going to need, if we look in the progress bar and we look at the cutting counter references, we can see the only one is literally just this. So we just have to listen to the event and then the rest of the progress bar works inside of it. So realign the interface is the only thing we need to define. So let's actually go inside the cutting counter. So here we have the on progress change event and then we have this. So we can literally just copy this, go into the I has progress and let's put exactly this. Okay, that's it. That is literally all we need. Now, if we wanted, we could also make a function to expose the progress amount. But since we included over here on the event, then we really don't need it. Just this is enough. Now let's go over here on the progress bar UI script. And instead of working with the type cutting counter, instead let's work with a type that has I has progress. So let's rename this to has progress. And it's going to have the exact same event. The only difference is over here, 
instead of the event args being the one inside the cutting counter is the one inside the I has progress. So let's make sure to change this. I has progress. Okay, so the signature matches. Let's just obviously rename this. So let's rename instead of cutting counter, let's rename has progress on progress changed. And that's pretty much it. We don't have any more errors. So everything over here is now working nicely with our interface. And back here in the editor, whilst we're still inside the cutting counter, sadly interfaces do have one downside when it comes to Unity. If we look in the progress bar UI, down there we can see the progress bar UI. And previously we had the counter field exposed in the editor. However, now by changing into an interface, there we have the issue. The field does not show up here. Interfaces do not show up in the editor because Unity basically has no way of knowing that the interface will be implemented by some kind of game object. So sadly, this is the one thing that doesn't work very well with Unity. The solution that I normally do is actually pretty simple. Instead of exposing the interface, which does not work, instead, let's just make this a regular private field. And then let's make a serialized field. And for this one, let's make it of type game object. And let's call it has progress game object. Okay, so like this, we have a regular serialized field with a regular game object. So if you look here, yep, we do have that field. So now we can indeed drag the cutting counter reference. And then over here in the code, in order to get the has progress, that is super simple, has progress, we just go into the has progress game object and get component of type I has progress. Okay, so that's it. Now our code does work. However, of course, one big potential issue with this is that over here we have a field of type game object, meaning that we have no guarantee that this field does have a component that implements the interface. So we cannot make sure that we drag the correct reference. We can drag any reference, doesn't have to have our progress interface. So in order to keep ourselves safe, let's add a nice safety warning. So over here, if has progress equals null. So if this one is null, that means that that game object does not have any progress interface. If so, let's do a debug.log error. And let's say the game object, and let's pass in this game object, does not have a component that implements I has progress. So this way, if we make a mistake, we will have a nice error message. Basically, this is the one workaround that you need to use since Unity does not support dragging references in the editor if they are interface references. Okay, so with that, everything is good. So all of our progress bar UI, this should all be working perfectly. We just need to go over here into our cutting count script and let's make it so that we implement our interface. So I has progress. And we got an error just because even though we did define that interface member, the on progress change, Again, keep in mind that the types depend on not just their name, but where they're at. So this type that we have here is the one that we define here, which is not the same one that we have here. So even though they have the exact same name, because they are in different places, they are actually different types. So we need to make sure to use the type in the interface over here. And let's just go into the I has progress and use that exact type and get rid of this one. Okay, so that's it. That's the change we need. And down here when firing, let's just fire with that type and down here the same thing with that type. Okay, great. So like this, the cutting counter should still be working exactly the same as previously. Again, when refactoring any code, always do a quick test. So let's do that. Let's make sure to save our counter, save the prefab, go back outside, hit on play. Now let's pick up some cheese, put it there, cut, and there you go. The progress bar still does work. Okay, great. Now let's apply it to the stove. And that is actually going to be very simple. First, let's go inside the stove. So let's find the stove counter. Let's open it up, go inside the prefab. And over here, let's drag the progress bar UI prefab. So let's drag that. Then down here, we already have the has progress game object. So let's drag the stove counter and that's it. There's nothing else we need to touch here. We just need to go over here into the stove counter and as usual, let's implement the interface. So the I has progress. And now let's implement it pretty much just like we did on the cutting counter. So we can actually just copy this. So we just need to implement the event. So that's it. And now for firing the event, Let's go down and see where we are modifying all of our timers. So let's go down to when the player drops something. So we do the on say change and now let's invoke this event. So this and for the progress bar for the progress normalize, this one's very simple. So just frying timer divided by the frying recipe SO dot frying timer max. Okay, that's it. We are modifying the progress. Now let's go up here when we are in the frying state. And when we do, let's fire off the on progress change event. Okay, great. And finally down here, when we have the frying over here, let's also fire, except obviously we have the burning timer and the burning timer max. And then just to make sure that the bar actually hides itself when we go into burned, let's also fire an event. This one doesn't have a timer, so let's just put it on zero F. Okay, that's really it. 
We don't need to touch the progress bar UI at all. Let's test this. Just make sure to save the prefab. Let's go back outside and head on play. And right away, yep, the bar is indeed hidden. Now if I pick up some meat and I drop it, and there you go, got a really nice bar going up. And yep, going up on the burning state. And as it gets to the end, let's see if the bar hides. So it gets to the end. And yep, there you go, the bar does hide. All right, awesome. And if I pick up something, actually this was the one event that we forgot, so let's fix that. So let's just copy the one where we set the progress normalized to zero. And over here, if the player picks up something, let's set the progress back into zero. So here we are, let's pick up some meat, drop it on there. Okay, let's wait for it to be cooked. Okay, it's cooked, now before it burns, pick it up, and there you go, the bar is gone. All right, awesome. Okay, so here we have, again, another example of the power of writing good, clean code. We made a nice generic progress bar, and we very easily made it work with a completely different counter. Which, of course, would also work with literally anything that implements that interface. It doesn't have to be a counter. Now, let me make one note here. Basically, I showed you how to make a generic progress bar and reuse it. But let's say you want to do something specific just for the stove. Well, one approach, like I mentioned, is to duplicate the code and make a progress bar that works only with the stove. But another approach is to simply add more elements on top. For example, during the polish stage, we're going to do exactly that. We're going to add an extra UI element that will show up to warn the player when the food is about to burn. So I just wanted to point that out, how you can mix and match both of them. You can have both generic components coupled with specific components. But for now, our progress bar, everything is looking pretty good. So let's leave that burn warning just for the polish stage. Now the next very important thing we need is some plates. So let's do that in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your Kodmaki. In this lecture, we're going to create the plates counter. This one is just going to spawn some plates, which we can then pick up to grab some objects. Okay, so let's begin making the counter as usual. So let's go inside our prefabs, inside our counters, right click the base counter, make a new prefab variant called the plates counter. Let's go inside and let's drag the visual for the plates counter. Let's go into scene view so we can see it. Okay, let's duplicate this, make this the selected. Let's go inside. And we can actually hide the circle sprite, we only need this one. So on this one, let's modify it for the counter selected. On the selected, let's make it just 1% bigger. And let's add the selected counter visual. Okay. Then inside, obviously, drag the reference for the kitchen counter. Okay, that's our basic setup. Now let's make our script to run this. So let's create a brand new C-sharp script for the plates counter. Let's attach the script to the plates counter and open. Okay, now here as usual, let's extend our base counter. And then first let's handle the spawn timer logic. So basically we want to spawn some plates every once amount of time. So let's store a simple float for the spawn plate timer. Then let's make a simple update on timer. Let's increase the spawn plate timer by time dot delta time. And then just check if it's above a certain maximum. So if it is above something, in this case, we're going to have a fixed value, but still, like I mentioned at the very beginning of this course, let us not use magic numbers here. You should never use magic numbers. Instead, if you wanted to make it editable, you could also make it appear as a serialized field. But in my case, for the design that I'm going for, I'm perfectly content with having a fixed value. So just up here, pretty simple, the spawn plate timer max. And let's default it to 4F and let's use it over here. Okay, great, so this is what we want. However, for spawning, it's actually going to be a bit tricky. The plate is supposed to be a kitchen object. The player should be able to carry the plate. And right now, for the design that we define, is that each kitchen object can only have one parent, and each parent can only have one object. But over here, we want to spawn multiple objects. Now let's quickly see what happens if we try spawning multiple as usual. So let's just go into the kitchen object, spawn a kitchen object, which means we need the plate SO. So let's do it up here. As usual, a serialized film, private, kitchen object SO for the plate kitchen object SO. So we're going to need to make this and then we're just going to spawn this object on this. Okay, so this is going to throw an error, but still, let's see. Let's first create the object. Over here, let's go inside our scriptable objects, our kitchen objects. Let's create the brand new kitchen object. Call it just the plate. For the object name, this one is a plate. For the sprite, let's go with the plate sprite. And for the prefab, let's make it. So let's duplicate one of these, call it the plate. Let's go inside it. And obviously make sure to change it, save the changes. Then over here, let's drag the plate visual, get rid of the tomato. 
and on the plate let's make sure to assign the plate and finally let's exit this let's make sure to save it and on the plate let's drag the plate prefab okay so we have the kitchen object so now let's just go inside our plates counter and over here let's drag the reference so the reference to the plate kitchen object let's also drag the reference to the counter top point then on the selected drag the reference to our base counter and finally start off with the selected disabled okay so this should be working let's just add a plate counter over here onto our scene so let's pick up a plates counter and put it somewhere in here over there on the side so on an x of 7.5 then 0 and let's say on 0 maybe let's make sure we have space for one more counter over there so let's duplicate this empty counter and let's put it over there pointing to the side so this one is on 7.5 0 and minus 2 okay so now let's just make sure that they perfectly match so let's put this one on a set of minus 0 0.5 okay so let's test all right so here we are and look at that and after four seconds yep there you go it spawns the object and then it immediately tried to spawn another one and there you go we have the error kitchen object parent already has a kitchen object basically the way we designed our game and set up the code assumes that a single counter will only hold a single kitchen object so we cannot have multiple plates on the same counter now one solution for this problem is actually quite simple when we spawn the plates instead let's not spawn a kitchen object instead we're just going to spawn a dumb visual then when the player interacts with the counter that is when we're going to spawn the proper kitchen object so let's do that although again let's keep the logic and the visual separate so over here let's first just handle the logic so we just need to keep track of how many plates were spawned so for that let's sort of here a private int for the plates spawn amount and let's also do another private int for the plates spawn amount max And let's say we can spawn at most four plates okay so over here instead of spawning the object let's first of all actually reset the timer so let's put it back to zero zero and on the plate spawn amount let's check if this one is under the plate spawn max and if so let's go into the plate spawn amount and increase it by one okay so that's the logic super simple now let's end on the visual so let's first make our script so let's create a brand new C-sharp script for the plates counter visual. Now let's make sure to add the visual. So let's go inside the prefab and over here we've got the visual. Let's attach it. Okay, open. Now here, basically the first thing we need is we need to know where to spawn the visuals. So let's actually add a reference to our counter top point. So let's add a serialized field for the private transform for the counter top point. Then let's also add a reference for the prefab we're going to spawn. So let's call it the plate visual prefab. Then here in the editor, let's drag the references. So the counter top point, place it in there. And for the plate visual prefab, let's go up here and find the visuals for the kitchen object. So these are just the visuals and let's drag the plate visual. So the plate visual, not the plate kitchen object. Okay, now back in the code here, we obviously need to know when a plate is spawned. So let's go into the plates counter and make a nice event. So public event event handler as usual on plate spawned and down here let's just fire the event so we just invoke with this and event targets.empty okay that's it very simple and then on the other script over here let's just listen to it which also means that we need a reference to our counter so let's add over here the plates counter for the plates counter so we're going to need to drag the reference and then on start let's listen to the on plate spawn event and when that happens then let's spawn so let's call instantiate on the plate visual prefab let's put it inside the counter top point so this is the transform for the plate visual transform and that's pretty much it okay so like this it should be working when the plate is spawned we should be spawning a brand new visual back in the editor we just need to drag the plates counter reference like that let's exit save the prefab and let's test okay so here we are and if we wait for four seconds we should be able to see a plate spawn yep there you go and if we wait for a little bit more we should also be able to see some more plates being spawned except we can't really see them that's because we're spawning them on the exact same spot every time but if we pause the game and over here look in the hierarchy and find the plates counter and inside the counter top point yep we do have four visuals and if we wait for longer, then nope, it's not going to spawn anymore. It's only going to spawn four plates. Okay, great. So to solve the visual, let's just offset them by a tiny bit. To know how much we should offset, let's keep track of how many plates have been spawned. 
So let's store up here on the visual script a list of game object. Call it the plate visual game object list. Let's also make sure to initialize this. So let's do on awake. Let's initialize this list. And then when we spawn them, okay, so here we have the object that we spawned. Now basically we just need to modify the local position. And let's put it on new vector 3. On the x, let's put it on 0. Then on the z, we're also going to have 0. And then over here on the y, let's offset it by a certain amount. And basically it's going to be based on how many plates have been spawned. So let's define up here a float for the plate offset y. Let's put it at say 0.1f. And over here we're going to offset it by this much, multiplied by how many plates have been spawned. So we can go into our visual list.count. So you can delay this, and then we just need to add it to the list. So let's add this plate visual transform dot game object. Okay, so now each game object should be spawned at a different height. So let's see. So here we are, and if we wait for four seconds, we should be able to see a plate. And there you go. And now after four seconds, we should be able to see another one placed slightly above, and yep, there it is. Okay, great. So everything is spawning perfectly, both in the logic as well as the visual. Now let's actually pick up a plate. So on the plates counter, as usual, let's implement the interact. So let's do a public, let's override the interact function. And now for picking up, let's first see if the player is actually empty handed. So if, and we check the player has kitchen object. So if the player does not have a kitchen object, then the player is empty handed. Okay, great. Then let's see if we have a plate that we can give them. So if the plate spawned amount, if it is bigger than zero, then there's at least one plate here. And if so, let's give it to the player. So how we do that is, well, over here for the logic, let's just increase it by one. Then let's actually spawn the object. So on the kitchen object, let's spawn the plate kitchen object as so, and spawn it on the player. And finally, we just need to update the visuals. So let's make another event. So up here on plate spawn and on plate removed. Okay, we have this event. And then down here, let's just, whenever the player picks it up, let's invoke this with this and event args.empty. Okay, great. So now on the visual, let's listen to this. So we're here on start for the plates counter, listen to this event. And when this event happens, we just want to destroy the very last plate. So let's grab the game object for the plate game object. And we're basically just going to go into our list. So the plate visual game object list. And let's pick up the very last one. So let's go into the list.count minus one. So this is going to be the very last element of the list. Then let's remove this one from the list. So plate.remove this one that we just grabbed. And then we simply call destroy on this one. All right, so that's it, super simple. So if we get on the plates counter, we do all of our checks. We cut it down by one. We spawn the actual kitchen object and we fire the event. And over here, the event listens and updates the visual. Okay, let's test. So here we are, let's wait for a plate to be spawned. And when it's spawned, there it is, I'm going to pick it up. And yep, there you go, the player is now carrying a plate. Let's drop it here. And there you go, there's another one. Now let's wait for a bunch more to be spawned. Okay, so the plate's counter is full. Now if I pick up, it should only eliminate the last visual. Pick it up, and yep, there you go, it'll eliminate that one. Now I can drop it in there, and yep, there you go, another one spawned. All right, awesome. Okay, so that's really it for the basics of the plate counter. It periodically spawns some plates, which the player can then pick up. Now in the next lecture, we're going to add the ability for the player to be holding a plate and pick up another object onto the plate. Hello and welcome, I'm your code monkey. In this lecture, we're going to add the ability for the player to be carrying a plate and pick up objects onto that plate. Okay, so here we already have the plate counter working. It has some basic logic. After a bunch of time, it spawns a plate. It spawns up to a certain maximum. And I can pick up a plate. And yep, the player is carrying a plate, so I can put it anywhere. Then I can, for example, pick up some tomatoes, slice them, and pick them up. However, now I am not able to place the tomatoes on the plate. So let's add that logic. Let's begin over here on the clear counter script. First, we're testing if there's no catch an object here and the player is carrying something that the player drops something in there. But then we're testing if there is a kitchen object here and if the player is carrying something. So it's over here that we want to check if the something that the player is carrying, if it is a plate. Now our plate is also going to have a bit of custom logic. So to help both identify and hold that custom logic, let's make a proper script to handle it. So back in Unity, let's create a brand new script. Call it the plate kitchen object. And let's open this. Now over here on this one, instead of extending mono behavior, we're going to extend kitchen object. 
So the plate is really just a more specific type of a kitchen object. Again, like I mentioned quite a while ago, you want to be very careful with inheritance. You need to have a very good reason to do it. Here we want the plate to behave exactly like a kitchen object, just with a tiny bit of extra logic. So in this case, it makes perfect sense. Let's just go ahead and save this and wait for Unity to compile. And over here, let's find our kitchen object with the plate. So here it is, the prefab. And as you can see, we have a kitchen object. Now, instead of having that one, let's replace that with the plate kitchen object. And since we are extending kitchen object, we have the same fields. So let's make sure to add the kitchen object as so and get rid of the other one. Okay, great. So now back here on the clear counter, when there is a kitchen object here and the player is carrying something, we can check if the player is holding a plate. And for that, we can check the type. So if let's go into the player and let's get the kitchen object the player is holding and we test if this object is of type plate kitchen object. If so, then that means player is holding a plate. And if that is the case, then we basically want to give the player whatever object is over here. We want to add it to the plate. So let's go into the plate script to add that function. So over here, let's make a public void. Let's call it add ingredient. As a parameter, we're going to receive a kitchen object SO. We really only care about the type. We're going to destroy the actual kitchen object like we've been doing when creating different types. So the plate is really just going to store a list of types. So up here, let's store a list of kitchen object SO for the kitchen object SO list. Then when we add the ingredient, let's just add it to the list. So this kitchen object SO. Let's also make sure to initialize the list. So let's do it on awake. Let's initialize our list. And now from the other side, we just need to call this. So over here on the clear counter, if the player is holding a plate, let's first get the type of plate. So plate kitchen object or the plate kitchen object. We go into the player to get the kitchen object and we cast this as a plate kitchen object. Okay, so we have this and then over here, let's call add ingredient and let's add whatever is currently on this counter. So let's get the kitchen object and get the kitchen object as so. Okay, so we're adding it to the plate. And then let's destroy what is here. So get kitchen object and destroy itself. Okay, so that's it. So if there is something here and if the player is holding something and that's something the player is holding is a plate, if so, we're going to add that ingredient to the plate and then destroy the object in here. So let's test. Okay, so here let's pick up a tomato. Let's slice it. Let's put it on a clear kitchen counter because that's the only one where we added the logic. So on this one, let's pick up a plate. And now whilst I'm carrying the plate and if I approach and I interact with it, and if there you go, it does work. The object vanished from the counter and supposedly was added to the plate. Again, we can use a really nice debug inspector to see it. So let's pause the game. Let's select the plate. Let's see the plate kitchen object. So here it is, this one. And let's change the inspector into debug mode. And down here, yep, we do see the kitchen object as on list and it does have some tomato slices. Okay, awesome. So with this here, we have our basics. We can have some ingredient and we can basically pick it up from a plate. Now, one thing about our plate, this is where we're basically going to carry the final recipe that we're going to deliver to the customers. And based on the design that I defined, I want something pretty simple. Meaning for the design that I'm going for, there won't be any kind of double burgers or double cheese. So each final recipe will only have at most one of each ingredient. So let's add some basic logic just to prevent adding duplicates. Over here on the plate kitchen object, when we add an ingredient, since the function will now not necessarily succeed every time, let's actually rename this. And again, use the very useful Visual Studio shortcut. So you can press Ctrl RR or right click and let's rename. Since this function will no longer succeed, we're just going to try to add an ingredient. So try add ingredient. And then let's also make it return a boolean. Basically for any function where you're not sure if it will succeed, I like to add try and make it return bool. So this way it works pretty much exactly like the try again component that we've already seen so many times. So it tries to do something and returns whether it succeeds or not. So over here, instead of always adding the ingredient, let's see if this one is a duplicate. So let's do an if, and let's go into the list and check if the contains, and if the list already contains this kitchen object as so. If though, then already has this type, so let's return false. And if not, then that means this is a brand new ingredient. So let's add it and return true. Okay, so that's it. Now let's go over here onto the clear counter. So we try to add the ingredient, but then we only want to destroy if this one succeeds. So let's put this one inside an if. So if we do manage to add the ingredient, then yes, let's destroy itself. If not, then we don't destroy anything. Okay, so let's test. So let's go ahead and slice two tomatoes. So one slice it, put it here. Then another one slice it and put it here. 
Now let's pick up a plate, go up here, try to pick up this one, and yep, it does work. Now for this one, and nope, it doesn't work. Okay, great. Now, one more thing in our logic. We only want to pick up certain things. Like I said, only things that won't be used in the final recipe. For example, no customer is ever going to request a full entire tomato. The recipes only have sliced tomatoes, so we should not be able to drop a full tomato directly on top of a plate. So let's change that. So over here on the plate script, let's basically just create a list of our valid ingredients. So let's make a serialized field, private, make it a list of kitchen object SO, and call it the valid kitchen object SO list. Okay, so we have this list. And over here in the editor, let's just drag the ones that we want. So let's first of all select the plate object. Okay, here is the plate prefab. And over here we've got all of our kitchen objects. So let's just drag the ones that we want to add to the plate. So the final recipes will have some bread, yep. But they will not have entire cabbages, they will only have cabbage slices. Same thing, no cheese, only slices. For the meat, we're only going to be able to add meat cooked, but also meat burned. Then we're not going to be able to add a plate onto a plate, of course not. And finally, inside of a tomato, just tomato slices. Okay, that's our valid list. And over here again, it's very simple. So we can just go, if the valid kitchen object is on list, if this one contains the one that we want to add, then we can add it, but if not, then let's return false, not a valid ingredient. Okay, so let's test. All right, so let's pick up a tomato and also some tomato slices. And now if I pick up a plate and I go into the tomato, nope, doesn't work, but the slices, yep, it does work. Okay, great. So here we have all of our basic plate rules. Everything is working perfectly, but it's only working over here with the clear counter. So let's do a little bit of code cleanup and then let's add this logic to all the other counters. So first to clean up this code, over here we are testing if this is a plate kitchen object. Then we cast to an object and then we call the function. So let's simplify all of this. And let's do it just like Unity does with their try get component function. So let's make a custom function that takes an output parameter. The best place to put it is on the kitchen object. So here we've got the kitchen object script. Okay, great. Let's scroll down and make a nice function here. So let's make a public. We're going to return boolean in case this succeeds or not. Let's call it try get plate. And over here, let's make an out parameter. So don't forget the out keyword. Let's return of type plate kitchen object for the plate kitchen object. And over here, we do exactly what we did. So we test if this object is a plate kitchen object. If so, then let's set the plate kitchen object equals this as a plate kitchen object, and we return true. But if not, then this is not a plate, so let's return false. And one thing when working with output parameters, you always need to make sure to set the output before you exit the function. So over here, that's the error that it's telling us. We must assign it to something when we return. So over here, we don't have a plate kitchen object. So to solve this, we just set this to null. Okay, great. Now over here on the clear counter, instead of doing all of this, basically let's ask the player if this is a kitchen object. So let's try to get the plate. Out plate kitchen object for the plate kitchen object. So you try to get it, then we try to add the ingredient and so on. Now obviously we could further simplify things by making a function that would try to get the plate and try to add the ingredient. That could work, but since some counters are going to have a bit more custom logic, I think keeping them separate like this makes more sense. So first we try to get the plate, then we try to add the ingredients. So let's apply the same logic to the cutting counter. So over here on the cutting counter, let's scroll down to where there is a kitchen object here and the plate is carrying something. So on the clear counter, we just want to copy all of this. So let's go over here and we do the exact same thing. Okay, that's it. And the other counter from where we can pick up things is from the stove counter. So here we are on the stove, let's scroll down until we find the interaction. Okay, there's something here, the player's carrying something. So it's over here, let's do that and do the exact same thing. Except on the stove, again, let's remember that this is using a state machine. So when we pick up something, let's do pretty much the same thing that we did here. So let's make sure to reset the state, fire the events, and so on. Okay, so those are the only counters that we need to implement. We cannot drop things on top of a container. We cannot drop things on top of the plate counter or the trash. So these are the only three types that we need to implement. So with this, let's test. Okay, so let's begin with some meat. So let's pick up some meat, put it on the stove. Let's pick up a plate, wait for it to cook, pick it up. And yep, there you go, it does work. Now let's test the cutting counter. So let's pick up some cheese, let's slice it, pick up some plate and go. And yep, there you go, it does work. And again, if we inspect, we can make sure that it is indeed working. So let's go into the plate. And let's put this on debug inspector. And yep, there we do see this one has a meat patty cooked and some cheese slices. Okay, great. 
Now the last piece of logic that we need is pretty much the opposite. So right now it works if there's a sliced object on the plate and the player is holding a plate object. But now we want the opposite. So let's say there's a plate in here and we slice some cheese and now I want to drop the cheese on the plate. So let's do that. And basically for this one, this one is only going to happen on the clear counter. That's the only counter type that can have a plate on top of it. So over here on the clear counter, then we check if there's no object there, but that's not what we want. We want if there's a plate on the counter. So if there is an object there and if the player is carrying something, then we check if the player is holding a plate, but if not, so if the player is not holding a plate, so player is not carrying plate, but something else. Over here, we need pretty much exact same logic, except just testing for the object on this counter. So let's do if, let's get the kitchen object on this counter. This one, try to get the plate. So out plate kitchen object for the plate kitchen object. So if so, if so, there's a plate over here. That means the counter is holding a plate. So then let's go into this plate kitchen object. Let's add the ingredient. And we're going to try to add whatever the player is currently carrying. So the player dot get kitchen object and get the kitchen object as so. So we're going to try to add this. And if we can't add, then we're just going to destroy whatever is on the player. Okay, that's it. And over here, we've got a nice error just because we defined with the same name up here. So up here, we're already defining the variable and over here, we're defining the same variable with the same name. So we can either give this a different name or just not define a brand new variable here. So just it's defined up here and we're using it here. Okay, so all logic is working. Now here, make very sure that you're not mixing references. Keep in mind when you're referencing the kitchen object on this counter and the one on the player. Those are two different things. So over here, if the player is not carrying a plate but something else, then you check the kitchen counter. So over here, you're not checking the player but checking the counter. Then you go into that plate and you try to add the ingredient and you try to add the one that the player is carrying and then you destroy the one the player is carrying. So again, be very careful here. Make sure you don't mix references. So with this, it should work. So let's make sure to save our script and let's test. Okay, so here we are. Let's first pick up a nice plate. Let's drop the plate in there, pick up some bread, drop the bread, and if there you go, it does work. All right, so now we can do a bit more natural interactions. So for example, let's pick up some meat and put it on the cooking. And there you go, the meat is fried. So now I'm currently carrying just some meat. So I place it there, then I pick up some bread and put some bread on top of the meat. And yep, everything does work flawlessly. Okay, so here we created a plate and we created some custom logic to define what the plate can and cannot pick up. Now that's left is actually being able to see what is on the plate. So let's do that in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your code monkey. In this lecture, we're going to add a nice visual to our plate. Okay, so right now we can already pick up ingredients onto the plate. So if I pick up the plate and I pick up some cheese, there you go, there's some cheese on the plate, but we cannot see it, so let's solve that. And the way we're going to do that is actually in a very simple way. If you look in the included assets inside the prefab visuals, there's this nice plate complete visual that I built. Basically, it's a full burger that contains all of the ingredients. What we're going to do is actually very simple. We're just going to enable or disable these game objects. That's it. So let's do exactly that. Let's make a new C Sharp script, call it the plate complete visual. Let's attach a script over here. And let's also make sure to put this one inside the plate. So let's save this prefab. Let's go inside the plate prefab. So inside the prefabs, here the kitchen objects, we've got the plate. So inside the plate, let's drag that. Let's drag the plate complete visual. Okay, great. So now let's open up this script. Over here, let's first add a reference to our plate kitchen object. So we serialize field private for the plate kitchen object for the plate kitchen object. Back in the editor, let's drag the reference. Okay, great. So now here, basically, we need to update this visual whenever the plate gets any ingredient added to it. So let's go over here into the plate script and basically just need to fire off an event when that happens. So let's make a public event, event handler, and let's call it on ingredient added. Okay, and for this one, let's also make an event args to contain the data of what object we added. So let's make a public class on ingredient added event args. Let's extend event args. And inside, let's make just a kitchen object SO, kitchen object SO. Okay, great. And let's make the event of this type. All right, so now let's just fire off this event. So down here, when we try to add an ingredient, if we do add the ingredient, let's fire off this event. So let's invoke with this 
and let's create a brand new one, passing the kitchen object as so as this kitchen object as so. Okay, so we have our event correctly being sent. Now we're here on the plate complete visual, let's listen to it. Again, as always, let's make sure to do it only on start. So the plate kitchen object on ingredient added, let's listen to this event. And over here, we just need to either enable or disable the visuals that relate to the kitchen object inside over here, the event args. However, of course, the question is, how do we exactly do we find them? The plate complete visual has all of these game objects. How do we know which one belongs to that kitchen object? Now, technically one way would be to do a simple transform find and find the child objects by name. Technically that would work, but like I mentioned in the beginning of the course, strings are a horrible way to identify things. They are very error prone. So let's not do that. Instead, let's use a proper approach where we can define some kind of link between a kitchen object so and a game object. And we can do that very easily by just defining a struct. So up here in our script, let's do exactly that. Let's define a public, make it a struct, and name it kitchen object so underscore game object. And then inside, it's very simple. We just have a kitchen object so field, and then also a game object field. That's it, super simple. By the way, if you don't know what is a struct, basically it's very similar to a class, except it's stored in different places in memory and behaves somewhat differently. I have a very, very important video on that subject. What is the difference between value types and reference types? Classes are reference types. So when you pass in a class into a parameter, you are passing in a reference to that object. Whereas structs are value types. So when you pass in a struct onto a parameter, you are passing in a copy. It's a bit of a tricky thing, so definitely make sure you go watch that video for more details so you don't get confused in the future. Here I defined it as a struct simply as kind of a teaching moment, but also because it just makes sense that if I just want to store some data without any logic, then it should probably be a struct and not a class. Although in this case, a class would work just as well. Anyway, so here we have a struct. Inside the struct, we have a field of type kitchen object so, another one of type game object. So now let's just make a list of this type that we can expose in the editor. So up here, a serialized field, private, let's make it a list of kitchen object so game object and call it kitchen object so game object list. Okay, that's it, super simple. So let's save and make sure this compiles. So actually let's just comment this out, just make sure our code compiles, okay? And over here in the editor, we see the tricky thing when it comes to using fields of custom types. If we look in the inspector, nope, we don't see anything, so we cannot see our custom type in the inspector. If you make a custom type like this struct and you want to show it in the inspector, then you need to add the attribute serializable, which exists inside system. So let's go up here using system and let's add the attribute serializable just like this. Okay, so do this, save, and let's look. And if there we go, now we do see our custom struct. So we've got a list and we can click on the plus icon and there you go, we've got an element and it does have a field for a kitchen object so and one for a game object. So that's great. With this now we have a really nice place where we can link one object to another. So let's just do exactly that. So for example, let's put the bread over there and let's assign the kitchen object so for the one with bread. Let's do the same thing for all of the others. So let's add a whole bunch more. Okay, so we've got the bread, then we're going to have the meat patty cooked then the tomato slices, then we have the cheese slices, the cabbage sliced, and finally the meat patty burned. So we've got number zero through five, so we have six elements, and over here, yep, we do got six, so we have all of them. We can get rid of these last two, okay, great. And now let's assign the proper objects, so this one for the meat patty cooked, then we've got the tomato slices, then we have the cheese slices, then the cabbage slices, and finally the meat patty burned. Okay, great, so all of the references match. Now back in the code here, so we have this list fully filled out. And when we have this really very simple, we just cycle through the list to find the right game object. So let's do a for each of type kitchen object so game object in our kitchen object so game object list. And we check if this kitchen object so dot kitchen object matches the one that we received in the event. If they do match, then go into this one, grab the game object and set active into true. Okay, so that's it, some very simple logic. And also we can start with them disabled by default in the editor, or just over here, just do something very simple. Just do a for each, cycle through every single one of them and set every single one of them to false so that they are hidden. Okay, so with this, all the ingredients on the plate should be visible. 
So here in the editor, let's just make sure all the references have been set. Let's go back, save the prefab, and let's set on play. Okay, so here we are, and by default, look at that, an empty plate, and yep, it is empty. And now let's slice some cheese. Now let's place some cheese on there, and yep, there you go, we've got some cheese. Now let's pick up some bread, drop some bread, and there you go, got some cheese and some bread. Then let's cook some meat. So let's cook it, and let's pick it up with a plate. And as soon as I go, boom, there you go, I've got a nice cheese bar. All right, awesome. So with this, I can now do a complete burger, so let's finish it. Let's just add some more tomatoes, so slice them and add the tomatoes. And finally, some sliced cabbages, slice them, put them there, and there you go, here we have a fully complete burger. Okay, so that's great, all of our visual logic is indeed working. However, this visual is a bit hard to see, it's not very clear to the player. So just looking at it from this distance, does that have a tomato or not? There's a tiny sliver of red in there, but you can't really see it. So we should probably add some nice clear icons on top to clearly indicate what exactly is on this plate. So that's exactly what we're going to do in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. In this lecture, we're going to add some really nice icons on top of our plate so we can easily see what is on there. Okay, so for the icons, let's do the exact same thing that we did for the progress bar, meaning let's use a world space canvas. So let's go inside our plate kitchen object prefab. And over here, let's right click, let's create a brand new canvas. Let's name this the plate icons UI. Then for the settings, let's make it world space, put it on zero, zero, everything, width and height also on zero. Then let's lift it up a little bit, so put it on a Y of one, okay, like that. Now inside, let's define an icon. So let's start by making an empty game object, call this just the icon template. Let's put it with a size of 0.3.3, .3. so okay, something like that. Then inside, let's add a new UI image, name this the background, and make it stretch to fill the parents, so put zero on everything. Okay, there's our background. For the background image, instead of a square, let's actually go with a circle. For that, Unity actually has a bunch of built-in sprites that it added in the last versions. However, it's not actually over here by default. In order to see those default sprites, we need to install the 2D sprite package. So let's quickly just go into Window, Package Manager, Let's make sure we are in the Unity registry, make sure we are looking at all, and over here let's find the 2D sprite package. Okay, so let's install this. Okay, there's the package, so now if we go into the background and we search for a sprite, and over here make sure you click to actually show the assets from the packages, and now we see a bunch of default hexagons, a bunch of isometric tiles, a square, so on, and if we search for a circle, yep, here we've got a bunch of circle. So let's use this one over here on this path, so let's use it. There you go, we have a nice circle. Now let's duplicate this image, and for the second one, let's name it icon. And for this one, let's assign just a random sprite, so let's say the bread. And again, remember how the sorting order on the UI, this one is based on the order in the hierarchy. So make sure that the icon is underneath the background in the hierarchy, that way it shows up on top. Okay, so we have our icon template, that's great. Of course, we're going to dynamically generate all of this through code. We're going to have multiple icons, and for positioning them, Unity actually has some really useful components. Let's select the plate icons UI, and over here let's add a component. Now for example, a built-in component is the grid layout group. This basically helps you position all of the child objects. So let's put the size of the canvas over here on 0.9.9. .9. Okay, so there you go, a nice square window. Then over here on the settings for this, for the cell size, let's put it at 0.3.3. .3. And if there you go, already shows up over there on the corner. And we can see what it will look like if we just duplicate this object. So let's make a bunch more templates. And if there you go, that's what it looks like. So as you can see, this component is super useful for automatically positioning all of the child objects. Now, if we want, we can play around all of these. We can add a little bit of spacing on the X or on the Y. But let's actually leave both those with zero. Let's leave everything on defaults. Just over here on the child alignment, let's put it on middle center. Okay, so there you go. That looks pretty nice. So you can see how this built-in component is super useful. There's actually two more. So this one for the grid layout, this is great when you want to put things horizontally and vertically. But if you just want horizontally, then there is the horizontal layout group. And if you just want vertically, there's the vertical layout group. So all of these components are really awesome, really useful. Okay, so with this, our objects are placed. And note how I named this an icon template. Basically a template is just what I call something that is kind of like a prefab, but not really a prefab. Through code, we're going to duplicate this template and dynamically modify the icon. So we're going to use it very much like a prefab. 
We could actually make this into a proper prefab. So I could just drag it over here onto the project files and make a regular prefab. That could work. And the only reason why I prefer this method of not using a prefab is just because this object, this template stays here on the object as opposed to cluttering over here your project files. If you have tons of single use UI elements with tons of objects you need to spawn, you can end up with tons and tons of prefabs and you might not even know where each of those is used. Whereas with this method, the template stays exactly where it's used and does not take an asset slot over here on the project files. So personally, this is just the approach that I prefer for spawning UI elements. But like I said, prefabs work as well. So if you prefer using prefabs, go ahead and make it. Okay, so let's make our script to run the plate icons UI. So let's go into our scripts and on the scripts folder, let's create a brand new C -sharp script for the plate icons UI. Over here, let's attach a script and open it. Okay, so now the first thing we need is a reference to our plate. So let's begin by making a serialized field private for the plate kitchen object for our plate kitchen object. Okay, let's save it and drag the reference. So over here, there's the plate icons. Let's just drag the plate reference. Okay, great. Now on the plate, we already made this event when an ingredient is added. So basically, we just need to listen to this in order to add the new icon. So over here on the UI, let's do, as usual, private void start. And on start, let's go into the plate kitchen object and listen to that event. And when that happens, let's spawn an icon. Although here, let's actually use a different method from the one we used on the plate visual. Over here on the plate visual, whenever we had the event, we really just modified the object that was added. So over here, the equivalent would be to spawn a new icon whenever that one was added. But instead of doing that, Right now, let's listen to this event, and when this happens, let's update all the icons in this display. Basically, this other method is useful when the contents can be added as well as removed. Now, in this case, they are never going to be removed, so in this case, both methods work fine, but still, I want to show you the second method just so you can use it when you need it. So for that method, we just need to know exactly what is on the plate. So over here on the plate kitchen object, we just need to expose the kitchen object as own list. So let's do exactly that. So public, we're going to return a list of kitchen object as own. Let's call it get kitchen object as own list. And we just return the kitchen object as own list. Okay, very simple. Then over here on the plate icons UI, let's just make a function to update the visuals. So private void, let's call it update visual. And when we have the event, let's call our update visual. Okay. So now here, let's basically just cycle through all the ingredients. So let's do a for each kitchen object as so in the plate and get the kitchen object that's on list. Okay, so we're cycling through all of the ingredients on the plate. And then we want to duplicate our template. So that means we need a reference up here. So let's add a serialized field, private, type transform, call it the icon template. Okay, and let's save the code. And over here in the editor, let's drag the reference. So let's drag the icon template. By the way, I left the others over here. That's not a problem since these are going to be destroyed. Those we're going to see in a little bit. The only one that matters is the first one. Okay, so here we have the icon template. So to spawn it, we do it just like we do with any prefab. So we just call instantiate, pass in the icon template, and then transform parent. So let's put it as a child of this object. This part is important. We need to make sure the object is spawned as a child of this object. If over here you put something like no, then the template won't be spawned as a global object. So it won't be somewhere in the world. So in order to make it positioned properly, let's make sure to use transform to become a child of this object. Okay, and then since we're using the other script, the grid layout group, this is already going to be automatically positioned. So just like this, it should be spawning the icon. And with the icon spawned, all that's left is really just setting the image. And now again, the quick and dirty approach would be over here when we spawn, let's say we pick up the item transform. And over here, we could go inside and do a find in order to find the image, in order to get the component of type image and so on. So that is one approach. That would be the quick and dirty approach. But again, we want to do things properly. So let's do it the proper way instead. So instead of this, let's make a proper script that we're going to run on the icon template. So let's create a new script. So a new C sharp script, call it the plate icon single UI. So this one represents just a single icon. Let's go ahead and attach it to the template. So over here, let's drag it. And now when using this template method, Really, the only one we need to worry about is this one. The other duplicates, we can just leave them. They don't really matter. But still, just to avoid any confusion, I'm actually going to delete them. So, okay, we just have one icon template, okay? And it has our script, okay? Let's open. Now, over here, let's basically just make a function to set a kitchen object as so. So, public void, 
Let's call set kitchen object SO. And we receive parameter of type kitchen object SO. Okay, great. So then we need to set the image. So let's just go into a serialized field, private of type image, which is inside the unity engine.ui. So for this one, for the image, we have a reference, and then we set the image.sprite, go into the kitchen object and grab the sprite. Okay, so all we need to do is drag this reference. So we're here in our template, let's drag the icon image. Okay, great. So now back here on the plate icons UI, so we spawn it, that's great. Then let's do a get component in order to get our script. So the plate icon single UI, okay. And then we just call set kitchen object so and pass in this. Okay, that's great, this is much better. Now again, you might be thinking that this method is a lot more verbose than just setting the image sprite here. We had to create another completely new script. We had to write this logic and over here, get it and use it. The quick and dirty approach would indeed be quicker, but remember that while the quick and dirty approach might be faster at first, it will mess you up over time. So just take a few extra seconds to do things properly. This approach is much more scalable. Let's say for example, on this function, you want to change not just the sprite, but also trigger some kind of spawn effect or animation. With this, it's very simple. We've got this function right here. We receive the kitchen object so, and we can do whatever we want with it. So like this, we have this script that is responsible for anything related to the single template. And we've got the general one, which just spawns them and just gives them the kitchen object so. So all of our logic is nicely separate. Okay, so just like this, it should already work. However, like this, you might already be thinking, won't this spawn way too many icons? And yep, it will. Basically, every time we add an ingredient, we're updating the visual, where we're cycling through every single one and spawning all of them. So with this, we're constantly going to spawn more and more items. This is not what we want. Over here on the update visual, we do want to update and spawn all of the icons. But before we do that, we actually need to clean it up. We need to clean up the icons from the previous event. So before we do that, let's just cycle through all the children on this transform. So that's pretty simple. You can just do a for each transform child in the transform. So this way cycles through all the children and then just call destroy on this child dot game object. So that won't work. That won't destroy all of the previous children. However, of course, we also have one issue. The icon template itself is also a child. So if we do this, we're going to destroy the icon template, which then over here, we're going to have an error because we're going to instantiate null. So we want to destroy all the children except for the template. So over here, that's pretty simple. We just check if the child equals the icon template. If so, then let's just skip it. So we can just call continue and there you go, it skips. Okay, great. So just one more final thing. If we leave the template like this, meaning the game object is enabled, like this, the template will always be visible plus whatever ingredients we have. We don't really want the template to be visible. This is just meant to be a template that we can instantiate. So that's pretty simple to fix. Let's make a private void awake. And on awake, let's grab the icon template, grab the game object, set active into false. Okay, so now the icon template won't be disabled, so it won't be visible. And then over here, when we are instantiating, the instantiated ones will also be disabled. So let's make sure we go in there and enable these. All right, that should do it. So all of our logic should be working. There's only one more tiny thing we need to take care of. This one is a world canvas. So like we saw with the progress bar, we need extra logic to make it look towards the camera. And thankfully, we already wrote an excellent generic script to do just that. So let's go into the plate icons UI and let's add a component and let's add our very nice look at camera. So like this, and let's set the mode the same that we use. So let's put it camera.forward. Okay, so everything is great. Everything should be perfect. So let's finally test. Let's leave the scene, save the prefab and head on play. All right, so let's go pick up a plate. And there you go, there are no icons visible. Okay, that's great. Now I'm going to place a bread on top of the plate. And there you go, I've got a nice bread icon. Okay, great, now let's make some meat, cook it. And as soon as it's done, I'm going to pick it up. And there you go, I've got a bread and some meat. Now let's put some cheese, slice it, put it there. And there you go, now I can easily see that plate has some bread, some meat and some cheese. Now let's just add the rest of the ingredients to make a full mega burger. So let's add some tomatoes and add some nice cabbage slices. And yep, there you go, it works perfectly. So here we have a complete burger with everything and we can easily see on the icons everything this contains. All right, awesome. Okay, so here you'll learn how to make yet another super useful element that you can easily add to all of your games. Personally, I use this kind of logic a ton in all kinds of UI things. For example, in my upcoming Steam game, Total War Liberation, the items in the inventory, they're all added using this method. 
So there's a template and I duplicate that template. Same thing for all of the action buttons. All of those are based on having a template and duplicating it. It's a really easy way to do this kind of thing. With all of that, here we have a full plate and we can easily see what is on there. So with this, the next obvious step is to actually deliver some orders. So let's do that in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your code monkey. In this lecture, we're going to build the delivery counter. This is where we're going to drop some items that the customers have requested in order to complete the orders. Also, just for fun, we're going to learn how to use shader graph to make a simple custom shader. Okay, so let's begin by making our counter. So let's go into our base counter. Let's create a new prefab variant for the delivery counter. Let's go inside and now let's find the visual, the visual for the delivery counter. Let's duplicate it to make the selected. Let's go inside, modify the material. Then on the selected, make it 1% bigger, 101. Add the component, the selected counter visual. Let's drag the kitchen counter like that. Okay, that's our basic setup. And also start with the kitchen count disabled. Okay, great. Now let's make a script to run this. So let's go into our counters folder and let's create a brand new C-sharp script for the delivery counter. Let's attach it and open. Okay, so now here as usual, let's begin by extending our base counter class. All right. Now let's override the interact function. And for now, let's actually do it exactly like the trash counter, meaning let's just destroy the object. So we just check if the player is holding something. So if the player has a kitchen object, let's go into the player, the kitchen object, and let's destroy it. However, another rule over here for the delivery counter is this is only going to accept plates. So let's see if the player is carrying a plate object. So player get kitchen object and test try to get the plate. So out plate kitchen object for the plate kitchen object. We try to get this and if it is a plate, then we destroy it. Okay, that's it. Here in the editor, let's just compile the script and drag the references. So the counter top point and on the selected, let's drag the counter reference and let's exit this, save the prefab and let's drop it over here on the corner. So let's find over here the delivery counter and let's put it over there. Angle it on this side, put it like this. Let's also just quickly reposition all of our counters since we already have all of the types that we're going to use. So on delivery counter, let's put it over here on this corner. So X 7.5, 0 and Z of 2. Then next to it, let's put the plates counter. So over there, okay. Then next to it, let's put a clear counter. After that, let's put the trash counter. And then let's also put another empty one there. So let's duplicate this one. Move it up to about this and put it like that. Now we just need to move all of these down here. So just select all of these counters. And let's move them down by about this. Okay, so on minus 5.5, like this. Okay, so everything is nicely positioned. Just over there, right now we cannot access that container, so let's actually modify those as well. Which, by the way, over here, there's the canvas in front, so as I click, I'm actually selecting the canvas in the hierarchy. So here's a quick inti tip. On the hierarchy, on the left side, you've got these two buttons. So one of them hides the object, and the other one simply makes it unselectable. So if I click on this, and I click through, any of the click goes through the canvas. So that makes it much easier to select over here all the items in our scene. So let's just select all of these. Okay, all of these. Now just push them all to the side and make another empty one and put it over here. Okay, that's a nice layout. Now let's just finish the rest. So over here, let's just duplicate our empty counters and place a bunch more. Let's put one more to the side. And now these ones over here. So let's put it over there and rotate it here and duplicate another one and another one and another one and just one more and get rid of this one. Okay, great. So here we have pretty much our complete map. Let's also just move the camera a tiny, tiny bit. Just make sure that it is nicely organized. So put it over there just so everything is nice and centered. Okay, so there's our map. Now let's get back to working on our delivery counter. We already added this code, so let's just quickly test. So here we are. And if I pick up something like, for example, some cheese, go into the delivery counter and interact. And nope, nothing happens because that one only accepts plates. Now if I pick up a plate, go there, deliver, and yep, there you go. It does work. Okay, great. So this is the basic logic that we want. For defining the actual recipe logic, we're actually only going to do that in the next lecture. But for now, let's add one more nice thing. Let's add a simple custom visual over here using Shader Graph. This is a great way for you to learn the power of Shader Graph and just how easy it is to use. This is a visual tool for making shaders. It's really very easy. Personally, I don't know how to write shaders with code, but I can build some pretty nice things using Shader Graph. As usual, I have a dedicated video on it. I also have an entire playlist showcasing how to make all kinds of interesting effects. 
and even one special video covering some changes in recent shareware versions. So over here, let's learn the basics how to use it. So first here in our project window, let's create a brand new folder. Let's name it just shaders. And now inside, let's create one. So let's create, then go up here into shader graph. Then we're using URP, so let's go inside there. And here we've got a bunch of options. Now don't worry about picking the quote unquote wrong option. All this does is just create a template. So for example, if you accidentally create an unlit shader, you can then easily swap it out for lit. So right now, let's go with the unlit shader. And for the name, let's name it moving visual. Okay, there's our shader graph file. Now, now let's just double click to open it. And up here we have the nice shader graph window. By the way, you can make this full screen. So you can either right click over there on the tab and maximize, or alternatively you can just click on this window and you can use the hotkey shift space. And if there you go, it does maximize. Okay, great. Now by default, we have this down the center. This is called the master stack. These are the actual properties that we're going to need to use. Then on the left side, we have the properties blackboard. On the right side, we've got the graph inspector. And finally, down here, we've got the main preview. All of these windows can be scaled. And also, if you don't see these windows, or if you accidentally hide them, they're all up here on these three buttons. So the blackboard, that's one on the left, the graph inspector, and the main preview. Okay, so now here we've got a nice empty board, so we can add whatever nodes we want. So we can right click and go into create node, and then we can write something, or just click anywhere and press on space, and there you go. Now we can cycle through and browse all of these menus to see all of the nodes that exist. There's tons and tons of them. Or alternatively, just go up here and use the search bar. So for example, let's find the sample texture to the node. So here it is, this one. Okay, we've got this node. What this one does is it takes a texture and grabs the color from it. So on the left side of the node are the inputs and on the right side are the outputs. Within the parentheses, you can actually see the types. So for the input texture, this one is of type T2. So that means it's a texture 2D. Then on the output, you can see there's a four, meaning it contains four floats, which in this case refers to the four colors. So that's red, green, blue, and alpha. So for an input, we want a texture. So let's set it over here as a property. Let's click on the plus icon and we've got a whole bunch of types. For a texture, we want a texture 2D. So let's go with that. And then for the name, now usually there are two standard names. There's one called main text or base map. Main text used to be the more common name, but when working with URP, for some reason, they decided to name the main texture as base map. So we're here, let's stick within the URP standard and just call this base map. Okay, there's our property. And if we click the selected and on the right side, we can see the graph inspector and we can see all the properties for this actual property. So we see a name, reference, and a bunch more things. Now, the really important one is over here, the reference. This is the actual name that you're going to use if you want to interact with this shader through code. The name on the property, this one is just a text string. So this can be whatever you want. You can even have spaces and so on. Whereas the reference name, this is the really important one. And by default, when you set up a name, it should already set the correct reference. Usually the standard is to name it just like the name, both without any spaces and with an underscore in the beginning. So just like this. Okay, then we can give it a default texture. So let's go ahead and select something. For example, over here, the bread texture. Remember, this is just the default. This will not be hard coded directly into the shader. We can then modify this. Okay, so we have our nice base map property definition. Now we can just drag it over here on the board. And yep, there it is. And now we can just click on the circle icon in order to drag a connection. And let's connect it over here onto the sample texture to the input. And yep, right away we do see it does work. So we are correctly sampling the texture. However, if you look on the main preview, over here there's still nothing. That's because we don't have this node connect to anything. We need to connect it to the final master stack in order to render something. So again, on the output over here, we can see a four. So these are all of our colors. And actually one very useful node is the preview since so many things in shader graph can be hard to visualize. So we can move these nodes around and let's add the preview node. And this does exactly that. So you can fit it an input and you can see down here what that input contains. So for example, let's drag just the red channel. And if there you go over there, we can see the red channel for this texture. We can drag the green channel, the blue channel, or look at the alpha channel. Yep, there you go, it does work. So this preview node is super useful for being able to see what your shader is actually doing. Over here we have the colors, so let's get rid of the preview right now. And in order to make it work, we really just need to connect the RGBA and go up here into the base color. And right away it should work, but you might not be able to see anything over here on the main preview. I believe this is a rendering bug in the current tech version. So right now nothing is shown. So if you still don't see anything, it's actually pretty simple. Just go up here on the top left side and make sure to save the asset. Okay, save it, great. Then let's exit from our maximize view. And now let's close this tab. 
Let's click on play just to play the game. Now let's stop playing. And now if we open the shader again, yep, there you go. Now we do see the shader compiling over there, that color, that is the shader compilation. And after a little bit, it should work. Let's just maximize this. So yep, there you go, there we do see our texture. Okay, great. So again, this is just a simple rendering bug on the current tech version. If you're watching this video in the future, chances are you don't even have this bug, so there's no need to worry. Okay, so right now we do see it working. We can see our bread texture, and it's currently being applied on a sphere. For our use case, we're working with 2D textures, so this would be best to be seen on a quad. So we can right-click over here on the preview in order to select the preview mesh. So let's go with a simple quad, and yep, there it is, we have our nice quad. Okay, great! So over here we have our basic shader. All it does is just shows a texture, that's it. Now let's actually use this. And first, let's always make sure to save the asset. On the top left side, on the moving visual, if you see an asterisk here, that means you have unsaved changes. So always make sure to save them. In my case, I don't, but still, never hurts to save. Now over here in scene view, let's go inside our delivery counter, so let's open it. And now for the display for our arrow, let's make it a flat quad. So let's right click in the hierarchy, let's create a new 3D object, and let's make it a quad. Let's call this the delivery arrow. Let's place this on top of the counter, so let's rotate it to face upwards. By the way, on the rotation, make sure the color is facing upwards. Most shaders by default, they only render one face and not the other one. So make sure you put the face with the color upwards and not the other one. Okay, so let's rotate this one upwards. So there we go, 90 over there. And let's just put it just exactly on top of the counter, so just enough so that it's visible. Okay, great. So now let's make a material for our arrow. So let's go inside the materials folder and over here, let's create a brand new material. Let's call this the delivery arrow. Let's make sure to use this material on the quad. So let's just drag it over there on the mesh render. Okay, so it's using our custom material. And over here on this shader graph drop down menu, over here we can select what shader we want to use. So in our case, let's go inside the folder shader graphs. And inside, yep, here we have our moving visual shader. So let's go ahead and use this. And yep, right away we do see that it does work. Here we have our texture being drawn exactly on top of our material. Okay, so far so good. Now again here, remember one very, very important thing that I said. The texture that you define the shader over here, the default for the property, this one is only the default. The important one is the one that we have on the material. I'm emphasizing this point because I've seen a bunch of people make this mistake. If you modify default texture whilst inside the shader, like for example, if I change here from bread, let's say into the cabbage slices, if I modify that, note how it does not modify any materials that were created. We are only changing defaults. So if you want to change the texture that is actually used, make sure you change the one on the material that you created and not the default. I changed the default but did not change this shader. However, if I now were to make another material, which by the way, here's a quick tip, you can right click directly on the shader file and go into create and create new material and it will automatically create the material using that shader. And actually here, it didn't update default just because I didn't save the shader. So I modified this one for the cabbage slices. And now if I save the asset, and now if I right click there and I create a brand new material, and yep, now that one does have the new default. But again, remember, what you set over here is just the default. What really matters is what is on the material. After the material has been created, modifying the default here does nothing. So always keep that in mind. In most cases, you want to be changing the property on the material itself, not the default on the shader. Okay, let's just clean up both of these. All right, so let's continue. Now here we have our sprite working, okay, except we don't want to show some bread. So let's actually use the proper arrow sprite. So let's select this one. And yep, it does work, it is printing the sprite. However, one obvious thing is that the arrow is not transparent like it should be. So let's solve that. Back in our shader graph, in order to make this a transparent shader, we need to actually go into the graph settings. So on the graph inspector, go into graph settings, and over here you see a bunch of settings that relate to the graph itself and not any selected property. So let's go into graph settings. For example, like I mentioned a while ago, you can modify between lit and lit and so on. So this is where you would change that. You can also appear add multiple targets. So you can create a shader in shader graph and make it work with the universal render pipeline or the high definition render pipeline or the built-in render pipeline. All of those are supported through shader graph. Now for our goal, in order to make this a transparent shader, let's just go over here onto surface type. Instead of opaque, let's change to transparent. And as soon as we do, look what happens there. And if there you go, it adds a brand new alpha channel. If we just save the asset right now, and open look at that, it still doesn't work. It's still not transparent. Basically, we made this shader transparent, but now we need to feed in the transparent channel over here onto the alpha. This is the one thing that is different from a previous version of Shader Graph. Previously, you could just feed the alpha channel over here onto the base color, and Shader Graph would automatically apply it. 
but in recent versions you need to add it over here separately. So if you have any issues with transparency when following some older ShareGraph tutorials, always remember this change. I covered that along with some other changes in a very useful video. So if you're following along some older ShareGraph tutorials, make sure you watch that video to learn what you need to do to update them to the latest version. Okay, so here on the symbol texture, we already have the alpha channel, so we just connect this onto the master alpha. And right there, we already see it working. Let's just go ahead, save our asset. And here in scene view, yep, there you go, now we do see our arrow. Now, one more small thing. You might notice that from some angles, it's not exactly transparent. Basically, it actually is transparent, but since we made this a lit shader, sometimes the light might make the transparent parts visible. One option to solve that is over here on the graph settings. Instead of making it lit, let's make it unlit. That would work. So yep, with the unlit shader, the transparency is perfect. But if you really want to keep it lit, then the other thing you can do is just over here, play around with these settings. You've got smoothness, AO, and so on. And over here, you can even modify the workflow mode. So for transparency, instead of making it metallic, let's go with a specular workflow. And then over here, set the smoothness to one and the ambient occlusion down to zero. And now if we save this shader, and look at that, then yep, now the transparent parts are indeed fully transparent. Finally, over here on the right side on the mesh render, if you want, you might want to play around over here with the cast shadows. So maybe you don't want this one to cast shadows. Maybe you don't want it to impact light probes and so on. Okay, so with this, we have our nice transparent arrow. Let's make sure to save our delivery counter. So let's go outside back into scenes and let's set on playing. And yep, there you go. We have our transparent counter with our nice arrow. Now we want the arrow to actually move. And doing that is actually super simple. Going back here in our shader graph, let's just modify the default just so we can see the arrow that we want to see. So let's select the arrow sprite. Okay, there's our arrow. Now for moving, over here on the simple texture, we've got an input for the UV. The UV is what defines what portion of the texture we're going to grab, which by default just gets the whole texture. So since this field represents where we're going to grab from texture, by playing around with this, we can grab different parts. So to do that, let's just add a standard UV node. So here it is. This is the standard UV channel. So if we connect this, then nothing changes. Everything still renders exactly the same. But now we can modify this. And to do that, we're really just going to use some basic math. Remember that when working with shaders, even though you do see colors, everything is really just numbers. So a UV2 is just a number, the color is just a number, the alpha is just a number. So visually, everything might look like images, might look like colors, but really in the end, it's all just numbers. So for example, how do we move this texture? Well, it's actually pretty simple. We just add a number onto it. So over here on the UV, let's just add an add node. So this just adds two numbers together, very basic. So let's take the regular UV and let's add something on top of it. For example, we can make a vector 2, and let's put it on, say, 0 0.10, and let's add this one onto this one. And now if we drag this one onto the input, look over there on the preview what happens. And if there you go, look at that, it moves slightly to the left. So if I modify this one, put it on 0, there you go, at that, 0.1 on that, 0.2 on that, and so on. So you can see that by modifying here, I'm essentially offsetting the texture. I'm offsetting on the X, and over here, I can also offset it on the Y. Basically, I'm offsetting the texture by 10%. The UV is a normalized value. This is not pixels. So that is why 0.1 is 10% regardless of how big the texture is. And if we go way past one, then the texture essentially loops back. So this is really all we need. For our moving arrow, we're going to have zero on the Y and on the X, we're going to constantly either increase or decrease. That's how we're going to have our moving arrow. So again, the only issue here is that I'm modifying this manually. We don't want a fixed amount on the shader. Instead, we want a nice animation. So for that, we have the very useful, the time node. This one has various time-based outputs. The one that we want for this case is the time, which is just the total time. This one is constantly increasing since the start of the game by the number of seconds. So if you use this over here directly on the end, and there you go, look, that texture is constantly scrolling. Okay, so that's great, except obviously we have one issue. We don't want it to scroll diagonally. We only want to scroll in one direction. So for that, we can essentially create a simple property to act as our speed. So let's over here on the blackboard, let's create a new vector two, call it our speed property. And for default, let's see if I want to say 0.1 on the X, zero on the Y. And now if I drag the speed over here onto our blackboard, okay, great. This is basically a multiplier, so we just need to multiply the time by this. So let's add a multiply node. Also, by the way, quick tip over here on each node, you've got a nice little arrow. So if you want to make it a bit more compact, so if you don't actually need to see the preview, so make that. And in this case, let's take our time, multiply by our speed, and then for the output, pass it into the end. 
Okay, so look at that, now it is indeed moving in this direction. And over here on the speed, we can play around the values. So if we put it at 0.5, now it's moving faster. And if I put it on the Y, now it's moving diagonally, put it zero on the X, and now it's only moving vertically. Okay, so this is really what we want. Let's just go ahead, save our shader. And now let's just select our delivery arrow material. And over here, yep, we've got the speed. If you don't see it, make sure that on the speed property over here, you have it exposed. So we have the speed instead of moving on the Y, let's move on the X. And actually like this, it's reverse going backwards. So over here, we can just put a negative value. So let's put it on minus one. And yep, there you go, now the arrow is moving perfectly. Also here, let me make one important note, just in case you're using this shader with a custom texture instead of the one included in the course. If you do that, make sure that the texture they use, so over here I'm using the arrow texture. Over here on the arrow import settings, down here under wrap mode, make sure it is set to repeat. If you set it as clamp, you might get some weird visuals or nothing at all. In order for the texture to constantly loop and constantly repeat itself, that one needs to be set to repeat. Okay, so here it is in game and we have a really nice moving texture. For that, we created a simple, but really nice, useful custom shader. Definitely go ahead and watch the various effects that I made in the shader graph playlist. This tool is super useful, definitely make sure you know how to use it. I've used it for making a building effect. I've made some nice outlines, a really nice wind shader. Also a really interesting dissolve effect. And even a cool transition shader, just like in the game Hades. So this really is a super powerful tool. Make sure you watch that playlist to really learn how to use it. All right, so here we learned about Shader Graph and created a really nice custom shader. However, the delivery counter still only has a visual. So let's create some proper logic for generating and delivering the correct recipes in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your CodeMonkey. In this lecture, we're going to build a proper delivery manager that will generate recipes that the customers are ordering and validate to see if the player made the right dishes. All right, so right now we have the player capable of making dishes. So for example, I can put some cheese, cook some meat, cut the cheese, and then pick up both of them. Then let's say pick up some bread, and there you go, got a nice cheeseburger, and deliver it. Okay, so that works, but right now they just vanish on the delivery counter. So there's no recipe we need to follow, no validation, none of that. So let's add both those things. Okay, first of all, let's make our script. So let's create a brand new C Sharp script for the delivery manager. Let's make a new game object to run it. So a new delivery manager, attach the script. Let's make sure to keep things clean. So reset the transform. And also by the way, since we're here, let's go ahead and put the plates and delivery counter inside the counter so everything is nice and organized. Okay, great. So let's open up this script. Now here, basically we need to define some sort of list to store all of the recipes that the customers are waiting for, which of course begs the question, what type is that going to be? Now, technically one thing we could do, since a recipe is really just a list of kitchen objects, over here, we could have a list of list of kitchen object. This would be our recipe list. Technically that would work, but that really looks quite dirty. Instead of having a list of a list, we should probably have a proper type for this. So let's write some good clean code and define a proper recipe scriptable object. Back in Unity, let's go inside the scriptable objects folder and create a brand new one. Let's call this the recipe SO. And over here, let's make this a scriptable object. So extend scriptable object, make the create asset menu. And over here for the fields, for the data that we need. Really, like I said, a recipe is just a list of ingredients. So just a list of kitchen object SO for the kitchen object SO list. Okay, that's it. That's really all the data that we need to define a recipe. Just to be able to identify them for the player, let's also add a public string for the recipe name. So just a nice name string. Okay, great. Now back in the editor, let's define. So let's go inside the script more objects and make a brand new one for our recipe SO. And now inside, let's create a brand new recipe SO. For this one, let's call it just burger. And over here, first of all, for the name, just name it burger. And then for the kitchen object list, well, to make a burger, let's, well, first let's add some meat and we want some cooked meat. We don't want to serve uncooked or burnt meat, so only the cooked meat. Then for a simple burger, obviously we need some bread and that's about it. So some bread, some meat, that's our very basic burger. Now let's also make another one. So let's duplicate this one and name this one the cheeseburger. Over here, let's name it cheeseburger. And like name implies, has bread, meat, and obviously some nice cheese slices. So there you go. Okay, we have a cheeseburger. Now let's also make a mega burger, so something with everything. So let's call this one the mega burger. And over here for the string name for the mega burger. And for that, we have meat, bread, cheese, Let's also have some nice cabbage slices and also some tomato slices. All right, that's our mega burger with everything. 
And finally, let's also make just a nice simple salad. So let's duplicate this for a salad. Let's name it salad. And for the salad, we don't have any meat, we don't have any bread, and also no cheese. So just cabbage slice and tomato slice. That's a simple salad. Okay, so here we have all of our recipes. So back here on the delivery manager script, instead of making a list of list of game object, let's just make a list of recipe. Recipe SO and name it the recipe SO list. This is where we're going to place the recipes that the customers are waiting for. So let's actually rename this. Let's put it waiting recipe list, okay? So the customers are waiting for whatever is inside this list. And now we could make this a serialized field and set it in the editor, but we don't want to have a fixed list. We want to periodically spawn new recipes. And in order to spawn new recipes, we also need to know which ones we can spawn. So for that, we could add a list of all of the recipes. Then we could pick a random one from the list and add it over here to the waiting list. That would work, that's one good approach. But since we already did something similar to that various times in this course, here let me teach you a different approach that sometimes might make more sense. For that second approach, we just need one thing. We need a scriptable object to hold all of our recipes. So let's do that. Let's do a brand new C-sharp script. This is the recipe list scriptable object. And then inside, this one is going to be a scriptable object. Let's add the create asset menu. And inside, we're just going to have a list of recipe SO for the recipe SO list. So that's it, super simple. Now let's just create one object of this type. We can put it inside the recipe SO list since we're only going to have one. So let's make a recipe list SO, name it the recipe list SO. And then over here, let's just drag our recipe. So we've got a burger, a cheeseburger, we have a mega burger, and finally a salad. Okay, so basically we have a scriptable object with all of our recipes. And now, just for safety, since we only want to ever have a single one of these objects, a recipe list SO, for this one, we can go back here in the script and simply comment out the create asset menu. So now back in the game over here, we can no longer create another type of recipe list SO. So just a nice safety thing, since we probably only need just one. And let's also add an underscore just so it shows up at the top of the list. Okay, great. So we have this and over here on the recipe manager, we can basically expose that in a serialized field. So let's make a serialized field, make it private of type recipe SO list, recipe list SO for the recipe list SO. And now here in the editor, we just drag that reference. All right, that's it. So basically the difference that we did with this method is over here on delivery manager, instead of having a list of all of our recipes, we just have a reference to one object and then that object holds a list of all the recipes. In this specific use case, like I said, this approach doesn't really have many benefits compared to just storing the list here. But let's say we had another script that also needed a list of all of our recipes. If we did that, we would basically have duplicate references. So this script would have a list of all the recipes, then some other script would also have a list of all the recipes. And then if you wanted to add a brand new recipe, you would need to add it to all the lists on all the scripts. Whereas like this, any script that needs to know about all of the recipes just needs a reference to the recipe list of so. And whenever we want to add or remove a recipe, we just need to update this one object and everything works perfectly. That's one of the benefits of this approach where you have a scriptable object to hold a list of all the objects of some type. Personally, I find this pattern to be quite useful. Okay, so on the delivery manager, we have a list of all of our recipes. Now let's just make a simple timer to spawn them. Like I mentioned previously in the spawn point logic, you could just use a coroutine if you like that. Coroutines can be useful for running timers, but personally, like I mentioned, I do not like coroutines. I don't like the pattern they force you to use. So over here, I'm just going to make a simple float timer. So a private float for the spawn recipe timer, another one for the recipe timer max, and let's say four seconds. Then we just do a simple private void update. On update, let's count down the timer. So time dot delta time. And if the spawn timer is under zero F, Let's reset the timer and now let's basically spawn a recipe. So for that, let's grab a random one from the list. So we go into the recipe list SO and grab the recipe SO list. Then we're going to grab a random one. So let's get a random index. So random dot range between zero and the recipe list SO dot recipe SO list dot count. So you get a random one. This is going to be a recipe SO for the waiting recipe SO. And then we simply go into the waiting recipe SO list and we add a brand new recipe. Okay, that's it, super simple. Let's just make sure to initialize the list. So let's do here a simple awake for the waiting recipe as on list and just initialize it. Okay, so like this, it should be working. However, we're also going to generate recipes nonstop. We don't want that, so let's define some kind of maximum. So let's define a simple int for the waiting recipes max. 
let's say we can have a maximum of four recipes waiting and then down here when the timer elapses so if the waiting recipe has only stock count if it is under the maximum then we generate an add it okay that's it pretty simple now for testing let's just add a log here to print the name so debug.log on the waiting recipe so that we generate so let's print out the recipe name okay so let's test so here we are and yep one was spawned right away so we have a salad and after four seconds yep there you go another salad and if we wait for four seconds we should have another one there you go a mega burger recipe and finally after four seconds we have yep we have another burger and now no matter how much time passes there should be no more since we're at the limit and yep time passed and no more okay all right awesome so we are correctly generating recipes that the customers are waiting for now let's add logic to try to fulfill these orders so over here on delivery manager let's make a function to deliver a recipe so let's make a public void make it public since we're going to access this from the delivery counter call it deliver recipe and the recipes are going to be delivered whilst on a plate so let's receive a parameter of type plate kitchen object and over here the logic is actually going to be pretty simple we just need to cycle through all of the recipes that the customers are waiting for and see if the ingredients on this plate matches the ones on any waiting recipe so over here let's cycle through all of our recipes so let's do a four int i at zero going through the entire recipe only stock count i plus plus okay let's grab the recipe so for the waiting recipe so and we grab from the waiting recipe so list on this index okay so we have that then first let's do a quick test just to check if the waiting recipe has the same number of ingredients as there are on the plate if not then we already know that it's not valid so over here let's do a quick test so waiting recipe so let's check the kitchen object as only stock count if this one matches the play kitchen object let's get the kitchen object as on list and also check the count so over here we know that has the same number of ingredients so this is the first check then we need to cycle through all of the ingredients on this recipe and all of the ingredients on the plate and basically see if both of them match so let's first cycle through the ingredients on the recipe so for each kitchen object as so let's call it the recipe kitchen object as so in the waiting recipe so let's go into the waiting recipe and get the kitchen object list okay so here we are cycling through all ingredients in the recipe then we need to cycle through all of the ingredients on the plate so let's do another cycle for the plate kitchen object so and we're going to go inside the plate kitchen object get the kitchen object so list like this so here we are cycling through all the ingredients on the plate okay so now here basically we need to see if this ingredient that we're cycling through if this one matches the ingredient on the recipe so here we check if the plate kitchen object so if this one matches the recipe kitchen object so if so then the ingredient does match so in order to keep track if it does match over here before we cycle through all the ones on the plate let's define a bowl for found or ingredient found let's default it to false and over here if we have match then this one becomes true and by the way over here we can also break out of the cycle now if you're not familiar with break basically this is going to break out of the for each so let's say the plate has 10 ingredients and the second one matches when this cycle gets to the second one it triggers a break so it no longer goes through the remaining eight so basically it breaks out of the cycle so it keeps writing some code right down here okay so we cycle through all of the ones on the recipe then we cycle through the plate and if we do find that ingredient on that plate then we have an ingredient found so over here if we have a not ingredient found then over here that means this recipe ingredient was not found on the plate so if that happens then essentially over here we have a fail state so the ingredient that this recipe requires is not on the plate so let's go up here when we have the same number of ingredients let's define a boolean called the plate contents matches recipe let's default it to true and over here if we don't find at least one of them then the plate contents do not match the recipe and afterwards we can check this ball again so if this one is true that means they all match if just one of them does not match then this one won't be false so over here we know player delivered the correct recipe so over here let's do a quick debug down log and print out a message and after we do let's also do a return so we stop the rest of the execution so basically if we find a waiting recipe that matches we don't want to keep going 
And also here, if we do find it, let's also remove it from the list. So let's go into waiting queue, remove at and remove at this index. Okay, so we're going to remove this recipe. But if this doesn't happen, then it's going to be keep cycling and it's going to cycle through all the recipes. So basically, if it reaches the end of this four, then basically no match is found. So the player did not deliver a correct recipe. So let's do another debug.log in here. Okay, so this is all for logic. It looks a bit complex, but I hope this was easy to follow. When we see it in action, it all becomes a bit more clear. So all that's left is just calling this function from the delivery counter, so let's do that. Over here on the delivery counter, it accepts plates, it destroys plates, but before we destroy, let's go into the delivery manager, which means we need to access a reference. So again, we could add a serialized field, or in this case, it makes perfect sense to make this a singleton. So let's make it here, public static of type delivery manager, call it instance with a public get and a private set. Okay, then over here on awake, let's set instance equals this. All right, so now over here on the delivery counter, we can go into the delivery manager, access the instance and deliver our recipe and pass in the plate kitchen object. Okay, that should do it, let's test. All right, so let's look in the log to see what they are waiting for. So there are two cheeseburgers waiting, another mega burger and a cheeseburger. So let's make a cheeseburger to deliver. So first of all, let's cook some meat, let's slice some cheese, let's pick up the meat before it burns, pick up the cheese, and we just need the bread. Okay, this is a valid cheeseburger, so let's deliver it. And if there you go, the player delivered the correct recipe. Okay, great. Now let's deliver something that nobody asked for, let's say just some meat. Actually, let's burn it, just for fun. Alright, so there we have a bunch of charred meat, so nobody really wants this, but if we deliver, yep, there you go, player did not deliver a correct recipe. All right, awesome, so over here, everything worked. We have a bunch of recipes being generated, and then we have the logic so that when the player delivers something, it checks if the player delivered something correct or incorrect. So everything is great. All that's missing is obviously some nice UI, so let's do that in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. In this lecture, we're going to create a nice UI visual to display our waiting recipes. Okay, so our delivery manager is already working. We are randomly spawning some random recipes every once in a while. Now, instead of looking at the console, let's add a proper UI. So for that, over here in the editor, let's go inside the canvas. And by the way, let's click on the button to unlock the canvas. And this is actually the first time we're using the regular canvas. Quite a while ago, we just created it. We didn't really set it up, so let's quickly do that. For the random mode, this one is meant to be a regular UI, so let's leave it on the screen space overlay. Then over here on the canvas scaler, Instead of constant pixel size, let's go with scale with screen size. Then for the reference resolution, I like to use 1920 by 1080. And finally, I like to fully match with the height. Basically, this means that objects in the canvas will be scaled if the height changes. For example, let's add inside just a quick UI image just to test. Let's look in the game view. So there we go, there's the image. Let's just put it on a different color. Okay, so there's the image. And note how if I modify the aspect ratio here, so let's say I put it on 5x4, there you go, the horizontal size of the window changed, but note how the element was not scaled. So I can put it even on free aspect, so really wide and does not change the size. Whereas if I modify this, if I modify the vertical size, the image does indeed get scaled up or down. Personally, I like the setup because it means that I only have to worry about positioning things horizontally. If the vertical part gets changed, everything gets automatically scaled. Okay, so great. So over here, let's go back into Full HD, all right, and let's get rid of the image, all right. Back in the scene view, let's quickly look at the canvas so we can select the canvas, press the F in order to zoom out, and also we can press the 2D button up here to go into 2D mode. Okay, so here's our nice UI. Now inside the canvas, let's create an empty game object, call it the delivery manager UI. Then in the inspector, let's make it stretch to occupy the whole thing, so let's put zero on everything. Okay, so this window now occupies the entire screen. Now inside, let's do just like we did a while ago for the plate icons, meaning let's make the template that we can then clone, but let's also put those templates inside of a container. So first of all, let's make the container. So a new empty game object, call it just the container. The reason why I'm going with this approach is because I also want to have other objects outside of here. If you remember how we did with the templates, we can actually go there and see. So let's go inside the prefabs, inside the counters. Actually, it's on the kitchen object. So let's go inside the plate. 
Over here for the template, basically we use the plate icons UI, this main canvas as the container. But if you remember how we did that, in order to make sure we didn't end up with duplicate icons, we always destroy the previous one when we spawned a brand new one. So every time we were cycling through the children of this object in order to destroy all of them except the template. So over here we're going to use a container so that we can apply that logic only to the children of the container and that way we can have other objects outside of the container. For example, outside of here, let's say we want some nice text just saying recipes in waiting. So on the delivery manager, let's make it a child of that one. Let's go into UI and let's make a text, text mesh pro. And this is the first time that we're using text mesh pro. So this window pops out. Let's actually import the text mesh pro essentials. Okay, just let it import. Okay, that's it. We don't need the examples or extras. So let's just close this window. And over here on this window, let's name this the title text. Let's set the text to something like recipes waiting. Let's put it up there on the corner. So let's anchor it on the top left corner. Also for the text, I like to put it on a width and height of zero, but of course that makes the text really vertical. So then down here on the wrapping, let's just disable it. So there you go, looks like that. And let's put it over there on that corner. Now in scene view, we are seeing things different. So if you want to see what this looks like, just go into the game view and over there, yep, we do see the recipes. Let's just make it in bold. So there you go, just some nice text. Okay, so that's our text. And then for the container, let's make inside the delivery template. So let's create an empty game object. Let's call it the recipe template. And for this one, we're going to want to anchor it to the top left corner. So with the template selected over here in the inspector, let's click and we want to click up here. However, we also want to set the pivot. So let's make sure to hold down shift in order to set the pivot over there. Okay, great. That's exactly what we want. So we want the template right on the corner. Then let's give it a size of say 250 by 100. Okay. Now inside the template, we just need two things. We want the name of the recipe as well as the list of all the ingredients. Although before that, let's actually make a nice visual for the background. So a new UI image for the background. Let's make this one stretch to occupy the whole thing. Let's put everything on zero. Okay, that's the background. Let's put it on a black with just a little bit lower alpha. Okay, that's good. Then for the name, let's make a text field. So inside the template, let's create another text. Call it the recipe name text. Then over here, let's put it a bit small. So on a font size of maybe just 20, let's put it in bold. And let's also again, put the width and height of zero. And over here, make sure to disable wrapping. Okay, so that's the text. So we've got it up there. Let's just anchor it to the top left corner. Okay, great. Over here, we can change the name to recipe. And then what we need is the icons down here. And for that, we're going to do pretty much the exact same thing that we did on the plate. But before we do that logic, let's just get this basic setup working. So let's just position everything. So first of all, the container for all the templates, let's anchor it on the top left corner and let's push it all the way over there. And for positioning them, let's use this time the vertical layout group. So inside, let's duplicate the template just to be able to see them. Okay, so that's pretty much what we want. We can actually set the width and height both to zero and let's set the spacing to something like 30. Okay, so that's our basic UI. Now let's make the script to run this. So over here in our scripts, let's create a brand new C Sharp script for the delivery manager UI. Let's go into the parent game object and let's attach the script, let's open. Okay, so now here, first we need a field for the container and another one for the template. So let's do a serialized field, private transform for the container and another one for the transform. And this is going to be the recipe template. Then let's do pretty much the same thing we did previously. So first of all, let's actually go on awake in order to hide the template. So game object set active into false. Okay, so first we hide the template. Then let's make an update visual function. So private void update visual. And for updating, we're going to do the exact same thing that we did. So first let's cycle through the container and destroy everything except for the template. So do a for each transform child in the container. And if the child is the template, if so, then we're going to continue. And if not, we're going to destroy the child game object. Okay, so we have the cleanup. Now all we need is to cycle through all of the waiting recipes. So that means that over here on delivery manager, we need to expose our waiting recipe SO list. So let's go down here, make a function to do that. Public going to return a list of recipe SO, get waiting recipe SO list. And we just return the waiting recipe SO list. Okay, great. So now here on the UI, we can now go into the delivery manager, access the static instance in order to get the waiting recipe SO list. So let's cycle through this. So do a for each, for each recipe SO, recipe SO in the waiting recipe SO list. 
And for each of them, let's instantiate and let's spawn our recipe template, spawn it inside the container. And then we just need to set this to enabled. So let's grab the transform for the recipe transform. We grab this one, grab the game object and set active into true. Okay, so like this, the only thing missing is the text, but that's okay for now. Let's just see where we're going to call this function to update the visuals. And as usual, we want to be smart and write some good clean code. So let's not do the dirty approach of just updating this on every single update. Instead, let's only call this function when something actually changes. So over here on the delivery manager, let's just make some simple events. So public event, event handler, let's call on recipe spawned another one, call it on recipe completed. And actually, as soon as I add the event handler, which also add using system. Now here we have an interesting thing. We've got a nice namespace collision. It's telling us that random is an ambiguous reference between unity engine.random and system.random. That is because both these namespaces, unity engine and system, both of them have a class named exactly random. So the code here does not know which class we're trying to use. To solve this conflict, we really just need to be more specific. In this case here, we want to use the Unity Engine version, so let's just write the full name, Unity Engine.random. And yep, that works. Okay, so now let's fire off the events. So first of all, the on recipe spawns over here. When we spawn a recipe, let's invoke this event. So this event targs.empty. And let's also get rid of the log. We know we need that, okay? Now we could also add the waiting recipe on the event targs, but in this case, we don't need it. Just firing the event is enough. And then down here, when the player delivers something, if the player delivers the correct recipe, we remove it from the list. And then let's fire off the event. So on recipe completed, let's invoke with this and event args.empty. Okay, so we have the event and down here we also don't need a log. Okay, so that works. And finally over here on the delivery manage UI, let's just make a private void start. On start, go into delivery manager, access the static instance and listen to both these events. So the spawn and let's also listen to the other one. So delivery manager instance on recipe completed. When either of these work, let's just go and update the visual. So just like this. Let's also rename this because again, instance doesn't sound like a very good name. Let's actually rename this to delivery manager and same thing up here. By the way, I'm using the visual studio shortcut control RR in order to rename this to delivery manager. And finally, we also need to update the visual on start. Just to make sure the previous ones do not show up. Okay, that's it. So like this, it should be working. We should be able to see no visual. And then as more are spawned, we should be able to see each one being spawned until the maximum. So let's see. Just over here in the UI, let's make sure to drag the references. So the container and the template and let's hit on play. And okay, right away, actually it spawned one recipe. It spawned instantly. Then after four seconds, there you go, a second one. And after four seconds, we should be able to see, yep, another one. Now four more seconds and we should see the final one. And now, no matter how long we wait, it should no longer spawn anymore. And yep, that works. All right, awesome. So the basic logic is working. Now let's handle the proper logic on the template. For that, like I mentioned previously, one approach would be over here. You could go and do a transform.find, find the actual recipe name text, then get the text mesh component and set it. That would work, but like I mentioned previously, that would be very dirty, not good at all. We should avoid using find at any time. And we should also avoid the individual logic from the total logic. So let's do it properly and make a proper script to handle each spawn template. So let's create a brand new C-sharp script. Call this delivery manager single UI. Single just because it refers to a single recipe. And also right now we already have quite a few UI scripts. So let's organize our project again. So let's organize a new folder for the UI. And inside let's put all of our UI scripts. So delivery manager single, this one the plate icons, plate icons, and the progress bar. So let's put all of these nicely organized in the UI folder. Okay, so with the script, let's go into the recipe template and attach the script. Now let's open. And over here, let's begin by adding a field for our text. So a serialized field. And over here, it's also very important. For the text, we are not using the text inside Unity Engine.UI. This is the legacy text. It is not TextMesh Pro, so this is not what we were using. Instead, we want to use text mesh pro UGUI, which is inside TM Pro. So we need to go up here and add using TM Pro, and now we can use this type. And also make sure you're using text mesh pro UGUI and not text mesh pro. This one also exists, but don't mix these two. These are two very different types. If we go over here in the editor, 
And if outside the canvas, if I just create and create a new 3D object, a new text object, if I do that, then if we we'll look over here in the inspector, we see this one is of type Text Mesh Pro. Whereas for the ones that we're using inside the canvas, if we we'll look, this is Text Mesh Pro, it's a UI text. So these are the two different classes within Text Mesh Pro. You have Text Mesh Pro and Text Mesh Pro UGUI. We're working on the UI, so we want this one. Okay, so we name this the recipe name text. Okay, that's it. Over here in the editor, let's drag our reference, all right. So on this group, let's make a function to set the recipe. So a public void, and let's call it set recipe so. And we're going to receive a recipe so, recipe so. Then we just go into the recipe name text, and we set the text to recipe so dot recipe name. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Now over here on the UI script, when we instantiate our recipe transform, let's get component of type of our delivery manager single UI and call set recipe so and pass in the recipe so. Okay, so let's see if the name shows up. And yep, right away it does show up. So we can see that we generated a cheeseburger recipe and right now a mega burger recipe. Okay, great. So all that's left are the icons down here. So like I said, that is going to be yet another usage of our template pattern. So inside the recipe template, let's create an empty game object, call it the icon container. And then inside that, let's make the template and template is just going to be an image. So we can just create an image straight away, call it the ingredient image. Let's scale it with a size of 40 and 40. Let's put a image by default, just like that. And on the icon container, let's put the width of zero, height of zero. And let's put a horizontal layout group, put it over there on the left side, and we can create a bunch more just to see how it looks. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Now over here on the single script, let's add a serialized field, private transform for the icon container, another one for the icon template. Then we do the same thing as usual. So when we set the recipe SO, let's first of all clean up the container. So let's do a for each transform child in the icon container. And if the child is the template, then we want to continue and ignore it. If not, we want to destroy the child.game object. Okay, so that's a cleanup. And then let's do a for each kitchen object so in the recipe so dot kitchen object so list. Second through all of this, let's instantiate our icon template instantiate it inside the icon container. So this is going to be the transform for the icon transform. Then as usual, we need to go into the game object set active in order to enable it. And also let's go up here, make a private void awake and on awake the icon template game object, let's disable it. Okay, we don't want the template to be visible. Okay, so we instantiate the template, we set it as active then since this one just has an image, we can just do a get component of type image. That's image, not image conversion. So image, so it's this one, the one inside unityengine.ui. So let's get this image and let's modify the sprite and set it to this kitchen object, so dot sprite. Okay, so that's it, that should do it. Let's test. Over here in the editor, let's just go into the template. Let's drag the container reference and the template reference. And let's also rename this instead of ingredient image, put icon template just to be a bit more clear. And we can get rid of the other ones or leave them, doesn't really matter. Okay, great. So let's hit on play and see. And yep, right away it does work. So we can see a burger is composed of a burger and a bun, a salad, yep, there you go, some sliced cabbage and sliced tomatoes, then cheeseburger, same thing as the burger with some cheese, and then another burger. Let's just deliver until we see the mega burger. So let's deliver a cheeseburger, let's cut it. Get this, get some bread, place it in there, pick it up before it burns. That's a cheeseburger, so that one should vanish. And if there you go, it does vanish. Let's see if something else, not a cheeseburger, so let's keep doing until we get the mega burger, just to see that everything works. So let's deliver a regular burger. Okay, now let's deliver a regular salad. Okay, just pick up like that, like that, and drop it. Okay, let's see. And yep, there it is, the Mega Burger. All right, great. So the visual logic is fully working and the delivery logic, all of it is working. So I can deliver the right recipes and get rid of them from the recipe waiting list and more are spawned every time. Here we can see the name of the recipe as well as all of the nice icons. Okay, so with all of this, our game is really taking shape. Everything is very close to being done. 
One massive thing we're still missing is an obvious one, which is sound, so let's do that in the next lecture. Hey again, quick intermission, you're almost at the end, so once again, congrats for making it this far. This is the second secret callout, go ahead, post in the comments a timestamp and a nice monkey emoji, it won't be fun to see how many people make it to this point. By now you already know about the website, I hope it's been very useful to you, and you already know to ask any questions in the comments if you need help with anything. So all that's left for me to say right now is, thanks for watching the course so far, and I really hope you've already learned a ton. There's only a bunch more lectures until we get to the final polished game, so let's continue on the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. In this lecture we're going to add some audio to our game, starting with a really nice music track. Okay, so our game is already looking pretty good, but everything is still way too silent, so let's begin by adding some music. Adding this is actually extremely easy to do. In the included assets over here inside the sounds, we've got a really nice music track. I hired the musician to make this, it sounds really good. It's a seamless loop, so to add to our game it's going to be super simple. We just want a constant, never-ending loop. So let's begin by creating an empty game object, call it the Music Manager. Let's reset the transform, keep things organized, and let's add a component, and we want the component an audio source. Here it is, this one. Like the name implies, this one acts like a source of audio. You will note how by default on the main camera, down here, it already has an audio listener. So the source plays some sound and the listener listens to it. Now over here we just need to set these fields. So for example on the audio clip, let's make sure to drag the music audio clip. Okay, great. Next over here, let's enable play on awake. We want it to start playing right away. And for this track, we do want to enable looping. Okay, great. Then for priority, basically Unity has a limit to how many sounds can be played at once. If you play too many, then some sounds won't play. And which ones do play is all based on priority. We always want the music to play, so let's put this one on max priority. Then for the volume, later on we're going to make a proper option screen to handle this. But for now, let's put it on something like 0.4 or 0.5, just to make a nice background track. Then we have here the spatial blend. For this music track, we want it to play the same regardless of where the camera is. So let's make this all the way fully a 2D sound. Okay, and that's it. We don't need to play around with any of the other settings. And just like this, if we are on play, and yep, there's the music. Now if you're not hearing anything, make sure that on the game view, first of all, that the game is actually selected. Make sure the scene is in focus. So over here I can move around so the game is in focus. Then on the game view over here on the top right corner, make sure that this sound icon is toggled. If not, then everything is muted. And also again, make sure, like I mentioned on the main camera, that it has the audio listener component. With all of that, yep, you should be able to hear the music. Now this song is playing and it will loop forever, just like we wanted. Personally, I really like how it sounds. I'm really happy with what the composer made. It perfectly matches the vibe of the game. So it really is this simple to add some music to the game. Let me just point out one thing also related to sound. One of the things you can make is an audio mixer. So for example, on the project files, let's create a brand new and let's find over here the audio mixer. So there you go, here is an audio mixer. Then you can double click to open up the audio mixer window. And then over here you have the master node and then you can create multiple groups. So let's create a brand new groove for something else. And then you can play around over here with the effects, with the volume, all kinds of things, all kinds of effects, everything. Then for each sound where you have the audio source, over here note how you have an output. And for this output, you can set it to play on the master so it plays on everything, or set it on just one individual group. So with this you could assign a group to one individual type of sound effect or the music or so on. Maybe you could even have your music split into multiple stems. So there's lots you can do, but for me, I'm not an audio engineer. Audio is probably the part of game development that I know least about. I just stick with the absolute basics. But if you want to learn more, definitely look into the audio mixer. This is an extremely powerful tool. But like I said, for me, I don't know how to work with it, so I'm just going to stick with the basics. So on the output, let's revert back into none, close the audio mixer, and get rid of this. And there it is, the music is playing, and it all sounds really nice. Alright, so here we very easily added some music to our game. This lecture is actually super short because it is generally that simple. Now the next thing that we need is going to be a little bit more complex, and that is adding sound effects, so let's do that in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. In this lecture we're going to add some sound effects for our game. Okay, so previously we already added some really nice music, now let's add a whole bunch of sound effects. In the project files, if we go inside the assets over here we've got all kinds of sound effects. Basically, I hired a really nice sound designer to make all of these, and I think they all sound really great, so let's add them to our game. 
Now, when it comes to sound effects, there are two main ways to play a sound. One is just like we did for the music, so we can create a game object, add the audio source component and play it. That's one approach, but that basically requires pre-preparing the sound objects. So there is another simpler way that just requires one line of code. So let's begin by making a sound manager game object. So a new empty game object for the sound manager. Let's reset the transform. Now let's make our script. So let's go in the scripts folder, create a brand new C-sharp script for the sound manager. Let's attach the script and open. Okay, so now here let's make a function to play a simple sound. So let's do a private void, just call it play sound. And over here, the way we play sound through code is actually super simple. We just go inside the audio source class. And in here, there's a static function, play clip at point. This, as you can see, takes an audio clip, a vector three for the position, and finally a volume. So basically, it will play that sound on that position. By default, Unity already has 3D sound. So if you play the sound on the left or the right side of the camera, it will play in the correct place. Also for the volume, the further away it is from the camera, the lower it will be. And if we don't want the 3D sound, we can just play directly on top of the camera position. Okay, so in this function, let's receive our arguments. So for the audio clip, it's going to be our audio clip. Then let's receive vector 3 for the position. And let's also receive an optional one for the volume. Let's just default this to 1F. Okay, so here we just pass this in into our function. So the position and the volume. Okay, great. So now let's call this nice function. And for example, let's start with a simple one. So let's start with the delivery sounds. So over here on the delivery manager script, down here we have the logic for delivering a recipe. And over here we know when we completed a successful recipe or when we failed and the player delivered a wrong recipe. So this is where we want to play some sounds. And again, here we have yet another very important clean code question. We could technically call the play sound function directly from here. That would work. But of course that would make this class tightly coupled with the sound manager. For a simple game on this scale, that approach can work, just play sounds directly from the logic code. However, again, to make things properly, we should really separate the logic from the sound, just like we separated the logic from the visuals. So instead, let's not call the sound directly from here. Instead, let's make two more events. So let's make one on recipe success, and another one on recipe failed. Okay, so now let's fire off these events. So over here we have the success, so on recipe success. And if we get down here, then we have a fail. So on recipe fail. Okay, great, we have two events. Now back here on the sound manager, we can just listen to those. So let's do a start, go into the delivery manager, access the instance, and listen to the on success and on failed events. So listen to that one, delivery manager, instance, on recipe failed, listen to both of these. Again, let's write some good clean code. So let's rename this one instead of instance. Let's put it delivery manager. And same thing on this one. Also name it correctly, delivery manager. Okay, great. So now when you have this, we want to call play sound. And now I want to pass in a reference to the recipe fail sound. So technically one approach would be up here to add a serialized field for an audio clip. That would work. But since we've already done that so many times in this course, here let's use a different approach that I also like to use. Let's create a scriptable object to hold a reference to all of our sounds. So similar to how we define the scriptable object to hold all of our recipes. Let's just comment this out just to make sure the code compiles. Okay, great. So back here in the editor, let's make a new scriptable object type. So let's create a brand new C-sharp script for the audio clip refs scriptable object. Now here, let's make this a simple scriptable object with a create asset menu. Okay, so now for the fields, if we look in the S over here, the audio designer that I hired actually made several variations for each sound. So we've got multiple chops, multiple delivery fails, and so on. So back in the code here, instead of storing a reference for a single audio clip, let's store an array for all of them. So we have the chop, then we have all the others, so let's just add all of the references. So there's a chop, there's the delivery fail, then we have the delivery success, then we have footsteps, then the object drop, then the object pickup, then we have the stove sizzle, although this one is just one, then we have the trash, and finally we have the warning. All right, so these are all of the sound references we're going to use. Back in the editor, let's just create the object. So on the scriptable objects, let's create a brand new one. Let's make it of audio clip refs so. 
just name it audio clip refs so and over here let's just drag the references so let's use that quick unt tip in order to unlock the inspector now i can select all the chops and drag them all delivery fails drag them delivery success drag it then for all of the footsteps after that are all of the object drops then the pickups then we have the sizzle which is just one finally we have the trash and the warning okay those are all the references so our script object now has all of the data we need let's unlock the inspector okay and back in the code here on the sound manager let's make another version of this function so let's make one play sound except instead of receiving an audio clip it receives an array of audio clips then basically we just call the other function so we call the other play sound function and pass in an audio clip from this array so let's actually rename this so audio clip array and let's pass in an audio clip from here so do a simple random range between zero and the array dot length pass in the position and the volume okay so just like this now all we need is a reference to our script model object so a serialized field private of the audio clip refs so okay we have this then here in the editor let's just assign the reference so the audio clip refs okay great and over here when we have the recipe failed let's go into the audio clip refs and let's pick up this one is delivery fail and then the other one is going to be delivery success for the position let's just default to the camera dot main transform dot position so like this the sounds will play exactly on top of the camera okay so let's test and see if it all works okay so here we are and let's do a wrong delivery now quick warning if you're following along or if you're just watching the video this sound will probably be way too loud but let's test so if i just pick up the plate and i just deliver an empty plate <coughs> yep there you go there's the sound and now if i deliver a correct one so someone wants a salad so let's cut a nice salad chop that chop this pick up the plate pick up that one and that one deliver the correct salad and yep there you go it does work all right great so the sound effects work, they played perfectly, but they're a bit too loud. Basically that's because these sounds were designed to be played in the world rather than on top of the camera. So when we play the sound, let's actually play it on the position of the delivery counter. Here is the delivery counter script. And based on our design, we're only going to have a single delivery counter, so we can just make this a singleton. So as usual, public static of type delivery counter, call it instance, with a public get and a private set then on private void awake let's just set the instance equals this okay so now over here on the sound manager we can just grab delivery counter delivery counter and we just go into delivery counter and grab the static instance and then for the sound position we can just go into delivery counter access the transform dot position okay so just like this on that one and on this one Okay, so let's test now it shouldn't be as loud. Okay, so here we are and let's do a wrong delivery. And yep, it does work. Now let's do a successful delivery. So let's make a nice cheeseburger. So grab some cheese, slice it, grab a plate, just need some bread and deliver it. And yep, there you go, it worked. All right, awesome. Okay, so this is really it. This is how we're going to play our simple sounds. Now there are some that are going to require more logic, like the footstep sounds and the stove sizzle. But first let's begin by adding the simple ones. So let's begin with the chop sounds. This is super simple. We just need to go over here onto the cutting counter. And actually we already have the on-cut event that we made previously. This was used to spawn the visual, so we can also use it to spawn the sounds. However, there's actually one difference. We're going to have multiple cutting counters. And this one, as you can see, this one is not a static event meaning each different counter is going to have each list of listeners and we really don't want to have to subscribe to every single one of the counters individually so what we can do is instead of making it a regular event that belongs to each instance of a cutting counter we can make a static event which won't belong to the entire class but we still want to leave this one just for the visual so let's do another one a public static event event handler and let's call it on any cut Basically for any static events that belong to any object type, I like to add the keyword any. We're going to fire this event when any cutting counter is going to trigger a cut action. So where we fire this event is exactly the same thing. So over here we've got the on cut. Let's do the exact same thing. So on any cut with this, an event dark is not empty. Okay, so we have our nice static event. 
And over here on the sound manager, let's listen to it. So let's go into the cutting counter. Again, we're going to access through the class name and let's listen to the on any cut event. And over here, let's just play the sound. So let's play the sound. Let's go inside the audio clip ref SSO and let's grab the chop sound. Then for the position, we want to know who fired this event. And by following the C sharp standard over here, we already have the object sender. So we know this was the object that fired this event. And we know this is going to be of type cutting counter. So we can just get cutting counter, cutting counter. And we just grab the sender as a cutting counter. Okay, so we have this and then over here, very simple, access transform dot position. Okay, that's it, great. That will play the cutting sound on that position on that cutting counter. Okay, great. Now let's handle the player picking up something. And for that, let's go over here onto the player class. And the way we set up the kitchen object parent system is actually already perfect for this. Down here, we have a function. So if we scroll down, yep, this function set kitchen object. This one is called whenever the player receives a kitchen object, which means really when the player picks up something. So if this kitchen object is not known, then that means the player picked up something. So let's do that. So up here, let's make the event. So a public event, event handler, call it on pick something. And then down here, just to be test. So if the kitchen object is not null, so if the player did pick up something, then let's just fire off this event. So just do our usual invoke with this and event args.empty. Okay, so that's great. Then on the sound manager, let's just listen to it. So let's go into the player class. Let's access the static instance and let's listen to the on picked up something event. And again, let's rename this to a proper name. So player on picked something. And over here, let's just play the sound. And for the sound, go into the refs and grab, in this case, the object pickup. And for the position, let's just go player dot instance and grab the transform dot position. Okay, that's it. Next for item dropping. Now we can only drop items on a counter. So over here we have the base counter class. And again, we have the same thing. So we have the set kitchen object. And again, the same thing as with the cutting counter. We don't want to be required to listen to every single counter. We just want to listen to one event. So let's make it up here. So a public static event of type event handler. And let's name it on any object placed here. And then down here, when we have the set kitchen object, we do the usual if kitchen object is not null. If so, then let's fire off this event. Okay, great. And on the sound manager, let's listen. So go into the base counter on any object placed here. When that happens, play the sound. And let's go into the audio called prefs. And this one is the object drop. So that one. And for the position, let's do the same thing we did. So we cast the base counter equals the sender as a base counter. And then we go into the base counter and let's grab the transform dot position. Okay, so we just need one more special counter type. Here we have the trash counter. And this one, it never really changes the parent. It just destroys the object. So over here on the trash counter itself, let's fire off an event. But again, let's make it static, even though we're only going to have one trash, but make it static just to be able to support multiple. So public static event, event handler on any object trashed. And then over here, just fire off this event. So invoke with this and event args are empty. Okay. So now if we go into the sound manager and over here, once again, the trash counter on any, not the on any object place, but on any object trashed. And on this one, let's do pretty much exactly the same thing. So let's copy this. The sound is going to be the trash sound instead of a base counter. We could just cast it to a base counter, but let's make it proper. So let's make a trash counter as a trash counter. And this is a trash counter. Okay, great. That's it. So these are all of our basic simple sounds. As you can see, all the logic is super simple. So let's test and see if it all works. Okay, so first of all, let's pick up an object. So if I go into a container and I pick it up, and yep, there you go, there's the sound. Now if I drop it somewhere, and yep, there's the sound. Now for the trash, pick it up, drop it on the trash, and yep, there's the trash sound. Okay, great. Then also let's check out the cutting. So if I pick up some cheese, drop it there, and cut, and yep, there you go, got a really nice cutting sound. Okay, so far so good. Now let's handle the more complex ones, starting off with the stove. For this one, the sound is meant to be looping, but only when the stove is on, so we don't want to just play once, but play and stop playing depending on the state of the stove. 
So for this one, instead of spawning the sound through code, let's actually spawn it on the object itself. So let's go inside the stove object. Let's go on the stove counter and open up the prefab. And inside this prefab, let's create a brand new empty game object, name it sound. Let's reset the transform, make sure it's on 000. Okay, great. Now let's add an audio source component. And for the auto clip, let's use the pan sizzle. Let's make sure to not toggle play on awake, but we do want it to loop. And let's also make it a 3D sound. Okay, so that's the basic setup. Now to control this, let's make a script. So let's go into our scripts folder and let's create a brand new C-sharp script called the stove counter sound. Let's attach the script over here and let's open it. So now here first, let's grab the audio source component. So we've got a private audio source for the audio source and just go on awake and audio source equals get component of type audio source, okay? Then we're also going to need a reference to the stove counter. So let's add up here a serialized field private of type stove counter for the stove counter. Then back in the editor, let's drag that reference. All right. Now on the stove counter over here, we already have the states and we have the on state change event. Again, the same one that we use to modify the visual. So on the sound, let's do pretty much exactly the same thing. Over here, let's do a private void start. And on start, let's go into the stove counter and listen to the on state changed event. And basically when this changes, we want to check if it's frying or fried. If so, then we want to play the sound. If no, then we don't want to play it. So let's define a bool, call it play sound. And we're going to play if the state equals we are frying or the state equals that it is currently fried and about to burn. Okay, then if we have a play sound, then let's go into the audio source and call play. And if not, then let's go into audio source and call pause. All right, so that's it, pretty simple. Let's just make sure to save our prefab, go back outside and let's start on play. And okay, for stars, there's no sound playing. Now if I pick up some meat and I drop it on there, and if there you go, there's the sizzling sound and continues going. And now it is still sizzling, but if it burns, it should stop. So if I go, and if there you go, the sizzling sound stop. All right, awesome. So let's take this one out. Let's actually trash it. Now let's pick up another one, let it cook. And once it's cooked, pick it up, and there you go, the sound does stop. All right, awesome. So we just have one more final sound remaining. That's the footsteps. By the way, the warning sound this is going to be added during the polish lecture. For the footsteps, we want very much the same thing that we did on the stove. So we're going to want a script to handle that logic. But this time we don't need an audio source on the player. We're going to use the same play method as the other ones. Let's just make a script to run the sounds. So let's make a new C sharp script for the player sounds. Let's go into the player game object and attach the sound. Okay. So here let's first grab the player reference. So private player player and on private void awake, let's get the component of type player and assign it to the player. Okay. Then for the footsteps, basically we want to play them every certain amount of time. So let's do up here a private float for the footstep timer, another one for the footstep timer max. And let's say we want to play say 10 times per second. Then we do a basic update and on update footstep timer countdown by time dot delta time. And if the footstep timer is under zero, then let's reset it. So set it to the maximum. And it's in here that we're going to play the sound. So now here we have two options. We can fire an event here and we can listen to it on the sound manager. So exactly the same thing that we've been doing previously, or we can just trigger the sound directly from here. Doing that will mean that this class is tightly coupled with the sound manager. Usually we want to avoid tight couplings. However, in this case, the player sounds class, this one is really only meant to exist alongside the sound manager. So in this case, it's perfectly fine to tightly couple them. So let's play the sound directly from here, which means we need a reference to the sound manager. We could make a serialized field or just make this a singleton. So let's do that. So a public static type sound manager, name it instance with a public get and a private set. Then on private void awake, we just set the instance equals this. Okay. So then over here, we can just access it. So just go into the sound manager, access the instance, and we call play sound, which we actually need to make public. However, this function also takes a reference to the audio clip array. 
So that means we need a reference to the audio clips. So again, we have multiple options. We could add over here on the player sounds, add a serialized field for the footstep sounds, or we can just make a specialized function over here on the sound manager. Both options can work just fine. Let's go with the second one just to be different. So just make here a public void play footstep sound. We're just going to receive a vector three for the position. And then we just call play sound. Let's go into the audio clip refs SO, and let's pick up the footsteps and play it on this position. And let's also receive the volume, just up here a float for the volume. Okay, so that's great. Now we just need to call this function. So over here on the player, instead of calling play sound, let's call the other one, play the footstep sound. Then for the position, that's the player transform dot position. And for the volume, I just exposed the volume just in case you want to make the footsteps a bit more sound or not. But for now, let's begin with 1F and then see if that's way too loud. As usual, instead of using magic numbers, let's define a float for the volume, put it at 1F. And over here, use the volume. Okay, great. However, you might be noticing an obvious issue here. Right now, this is going to play non-stop. Obviously, we don't want to do that. We only want to play footstep sounds if the player is actually moving. So this is pretty simple. We just need to ask the player if it is moving. And we already did that, so player is walking. So if the player is walking, then we play the sounds. If not, we don't. Okay, that's it, so let's test. So here we are, and if I'm standing still, there's no footsteps. Okay, that's great. And as soon as I move, yep, there you go. We got some nice footstep sounds. All right, great. So with all of that, we added all of our sounds. Now here, note how we mostly use this method of going into the audio source and using the play clip at point function. This one is great because it is so simple, but it does have limitations, specifically with regards to all of the options. If we look on the audio source component, here we have all these options. So you can use an output, use an audio mixer like we saw in the previous lecture. We can play around priority, play around the pitch, make it 2D or 3D, play around over here with how the sound falls off. So tons and tons of options that you can't really access if you use that simple function. So one approach, if you need these options, you could make each sound a prefab. So make a prefab for each different audio clip. And then instead of calling that function, you would simply instantiate that prefab to spawn that audio. So you've got lots of options depending on how complex you want your sound to be. But for a simple game and for simple sounds, this one line of code is super simple. All right, so here we have added sound effects to our game. That coupled with the music that we had previously already makes everything sound so much more alive. It's really starting to look like a proper game. The one thing we still don't have is some kind of game start and game end scenario. So let's add that in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your code monkey. In this lecture, let's add a simple beginning state to our game. So right now we can play the game. All of the mechanics, everything works perfectly, it's all been implemented. However, in the beginning of the game, it just starts right away as it loads. There's no start, no countdown, no time for the player to get ready. So let's sort that out with a simple countdown. Let's begin by making a general game manager script to handle all of our general game states. So let's create a brand new C Sharp script. And now here you could use the name game manager. So you could use this name. However, for some reason, Unity likes to add this custom icon when a script is named exactly Game Manager. Personally, I don't like this. I don't want it to be a different icon. I want this script to look 